<laughs> What's up? I already knew. I know some of y'all out there was guessing Rod B was going to be the afternoon drive. Hey, man, I appreciate all y'all that was guessing Rod B. For those who thought it was Matthew McConaughey, I hate to disappoint you. <laughs> I hate to disappoint you, but it's all good, man. The originals, baby. The original Lifetime Longhorn and the original Orange Blood hooking up, man. This is like when, when Suge Knight and, uh, and, 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 and Dr. Dre went out Pac out of jail. They bailed him out and we went out with death row. That's, that's how I feel right now. Feel like Pac, baby. So, hey, I appreciate everybody who's uh, supporting it, everybody who's been on the stream. Hey, I couldn't say nothing. I couldn't reveal nothing. And everybody involved has been uh, great with this partnership. So I just want to say a shout out to Orange Bloods. Shout out to my man, Blake. He's producing behind the scenes. Trust me, he's the magic man making stuff happen. I'm just talking. All right, we're going to have some fun, have a ton of it. We're going to talk a lot of Longhorns. We're going to talk some Cowboys, talk lots of NFL, of course. Uh, we're also going to get into uh, a ton of different topics, actually. Uh, you know, it's Rod B's Theater of the Mind, so it's going to be anything that's on my mind. We're going to get into it and drop it. So a uh, ton of stuff to get into. You know how to hit me up. I'll be uh, paying attention as, as much as I can, all right, to all of the, the different chats and all the different messages that are sent. I appreciate that. I uh, appreciate all you guys. And also – just so you know, uh, we will be getting on in a super chat a little bit later on. So we'll answer some questions from the people just to make sure that, you know, we make sure you guys are covered. Anything that y'all want to talk about, we'll get into that later on. We got three hours, so we got plenty of time to do it. All right. That's the best way to hit us up. You already know it. Don't worry. I'm still on in the mornings on the radio. This is just a YouTube thing, baby. We're doing something different. I ain't never done this before. So y'all forgive me. I apologize if, you know, it takes me a little while to get the hang of it. Okay, let's dive into it, man. Let's not waste any time. Let's talk Texas football. So uh, I was really pumped yesterday hearing Sark. All right, Sark is pumped because he's, first of all, let's address the unofficial mascot of Texas football now, baby. It's John Wick. Ironically, I watched all four John Wick movies like last weekend. Quinn Ewers inspired me because at Big 12 Media Days, he made a John Wick reference. When they ask Quinn Ewers, hey, Quinn, you know, how does it feel having a target on you because you're picked to win the Big 12? And then Quinn remarks, you know what? I kind of it's kind of like, you know, John Wick. It's a target on us, but we flip it around and it becomes a target on them. Right. The hunt hunted becomes the hunter, which is kind of one of the themes of John Wick. We ain't going to do too many spoiler alerts in case you haven't seen it. But I watched all of them back to back to back. All four. All right. Because I had a guy weekend. My wife was out of town. And I got a chance to do it. One of my last attempts at having a guy weekend with wifey out of town. So I watched all of them back to back to back. So I got I got John Wick in the head right now. And then uh, yesterday we hear Sark make the reference to John Wick when he's asked. And I believe it's my man, Will Matthews, Lifetime Longhorn, who asked him, hey, man, what are your themes for the season? He didn't even ask him about John Wick. He didn't make the reference to Quinn Ewers. And then Sark pivots and mentions and references John Wick. Well, it's official, official, guys. You got it from the face of the team right now, the face of the team in Quinn Ewers. You got it from the head coach in Steve Sarkeesian. Quinn, we know that now that around that locker room, the unofficial mascot of Texas football's 2022, uh, 2023 season is going to be John Wick. So Quinn Wick, we'll call him that when he's out there dealing. All right. Uh, but one of the, and the theme is, is more than just the hunted becoming the hunter. Right, because John Wick originally is a hunter that becomes the hunt dead, and then he becomes a hunter. But one of the things about John Wick that I love, almost in every movie, the question comes, just like the question comes from Texas football, seems like every year. Are you back? If you what, I'm not spoiling too much. It's all it's all I'll get to. They they keep throwing the question out there. Are you back? Are you back? I feel like every year we ask the same thing about Texas. Are you back? Are you back? Is this a year? Are you back? This seems to be the year they want to say it. Now, life, legendary Lifetime Longhorn Sam Ellinger, hey, man, he gave us at least a little bit of salvation for one year, and he said Texas was back, even though we know Texas actually wasn't back. It, it wasn't back. It was like that gift from uh, from Abe, uh, from the Simpsons, the uh, the grandfather, when he walks in the bar, puts his hat up, walks back out, to put his hat back on. That that was that was Texas' version of being back. That ain't, that ain't back. All right, back is competing for championships every year, college football playoff year after year. That's Texas being back. And they keep asking John Wick the same question. And at one point, John Wick's just a little fed up. He gets a little bit fed up. And he's like, well, you're damn right I'm back. I'm coming back. So hopefully this is Texas channeling their inner John Wick 
and they're coming back. Oh, by the way, uh, the graphics department uh, for, te for Texas and the uh, imaging, whoever do the Jumbotron and all that kind of stuff, you already know. We don't need the violence. We just need references to John Wick. You can leave out the violence. I understand. Hey, we don't even call it Red River Shootout anymore. All right. We call it the Red River Rivalry, which if you have like two or three beers, it's tough to say. Can't say that five times fast. All right. Uh, shout out to my man, Craig Wade Lifetime, Long, uh, the voice of Longhorns, uh, and also one of my good friends. He likes to call it the State Fair Street Fight. He won't do that officially. He won't do that in front of y'all. But that's our thing. All right. And I like to throw it out there. That's what I call it, too. Just a little uh, sidebar there. The State Fair Street Fight. Anyway, I digress. Getting back to it. John Wick, unofficial mascot. Let's make it happen, y'all. I need imaging with Quinn Ewers face on a John Wick body, you know, with all that kind of stuff. I think my man Nash already did that, so shout out to him. Let's let's get it done. Let's go ahead, because this is if it's supposed to be the year, that's supposed to be the year. Let's do the damn thing. Okay. All right. Uh, let's get to some Texas football. So one thing I like from my man Steve Sarkeesian, because he says his team looks like his team, talks like his team. It it, you know, it walks like his team, smells like his team. He didn't say smells. I'm just throwing that in there. Actually, does anybody know, a lot of people out there, do you all know how Steve Sarkeesian smells? I'd like to know how my coach smells. You know what I mean? He looks like he smells like high fashion, like high dollar fashion, right? He dresses real nice. Wifey is a fashionista. He looks like he smells like Gucci. Smells like Louis Vuitton. You know what I'm saying? He smells like something like that. Like it, it you know. It, I don't know exactly how he smells. If y'all know how he smells, please let me know. Because I want to know how Sark smells. He looks like he smells good. But if the team smells like him, then now I'm assuming they smell good too. Uh, anyway, I'll get back to it. My point is, he said the team, this is his team. It, it's in every way. The attitude of it, built like it. They're going to have swag like, like Sark. And I like that. So this is the one, and I, I forget the uh, reporter that asked the question, so I apologize. But I remember the answer. It was like the second question. That might have been the first question, actually, after the opening statement. Where Sarks asked, you know, what's standing in your way of you guys accomplishing your goals? What's standing in your way? And he goes on for a while. He goes on because he's, he's Sark. He goes on for a little while. He makes some great points. But then Sark actually says at the end, I love the moment too. He says, you know, honestly, it's us. You know, we it's us. You know, we're standing in our way. And that's right. It It, it is. There's no question about it. The only thing standing in Texas' way is Texas because it's been until we talk about in terms of winning a big 12 title. It always it reminds you of that old quote from Obama when he was running, right? Uh, the, the, we are who we've been waiting for. We are, right? We are the, we are the ones we've been waiting for kind of confusing some, but that's kind of what it is. Right. And for Texas this season, they honestly, they, they, to me, if they end up falling short or underachieving, it'll be because, the coaching fell short or the players didn't develop on the same trajectory. It'll be something along those lines. And, you know, if you start looking at Texas right now, and this is why you should be optimistic. I'm optimistic. You guys know, usually I'm just a realist. I'm optimistic. You go look at the biggest issues for Texas last season, right? The biggest issues for Texas last season in 2021. Hey, you guys know I still got my notes, man. Okay, I, I can't. Even though I'm not on the radio, I still got my notes. <laughs> All right. Uh, and starting for us from Sark's first year, the biggest issue was ugh, the blown leads. Guys, it was it was unbelievable. I mean, they had some of the biggest blown leads in the country. As a matter of fact, that Texas Oklahoma game. I hate to bring this up. I'm just trying to set. I apologize. I ain't trying to bring up hurtful stuff trying to set the mood a little bit, all right, give you context. The biggest issue were those blown leads. And they actually had, in addition to the biggest blown lead in Texas football history against Oklahoma, your rival, which that kind of set the tone for everything else for the rest of the season. You had four straight blown halftime leads, all losses, and you had three straight games with double-digit leads and end up losing. You fix that. That was your biggest issue in 2021 is that you would get up because Sark is really good at game planning and preparation. Game planning and preparation, you got all week to do it during football season, right? You got that whole week. And if you 
if you actually designated time in the offseason for Alabama, like Texas did last season, and like they'll do again this season. And you know, there are some games where you, you designate some. We did extra little prep work in the offseason when there was time. Like, all right, you know what? If there's time, let's do some Oklahoma work in the offseason. Let's, you know, because that's what it's going to come down to playing against Oklahoma, right? Uh, that's a team that can match you in, in, in skill and talent and coaching and acumen. And, you know, you do that with Alabama. That's your big showcase game. So Texas, I'm sure, did that. We learned that last season. They put a lot of time in on Alabama. Sort of did the same thing again. So Sart ended up fixing that issue. And it was, a, it was an embarrassing one. Like, that was one with Longhorns. They had to... They, you know, their head, they, they, you know, they couldn't even he- keep their head high <laughs> about being a Longhorn fan that season because of the way in which Texas was losing those games. Fast forward to 2022, fix that issue. There are no double digit blown leads. Um, there is no epic collapse like there was in 2021. Texas wasn't collapsing in on itself like a dying star, like it did multiple times in 2021. Um, and in 2021, uh, too often, I'm not going to get deep into that because we way past that. Texas was UTMZ, where they ended up making headlines for the wrong reasons. Uh, the Bo Davis situation. And by the way, love Bo Davis. It ain't on Bo Davis. Some Like I always said, a player should have been having that rant and going off like that. It shouldn't have been Bo Davis. Bo Davis did it because nobody stepped up and did it. He was like, so uh, y- y'all cool with the way y'all lost around here? Y'all just going to sit back and take it. You know what? I ain't taking it. Boom. In my day, that would have been Casey Hampton. That would have been a Corey Redding. That would have been a D.D. Lewis. That would have been, you know, that would have been one of those guys, Quentin Jammer. Somebody would have stepped up and dog cussed everybody and said, hell no, that ain't, that's not my brand. Y'all better get it together. Let's just, let's, let's, let's be accountable. Um, so Bo Davis did it because they didn't have the leadership at the time. And they did, by the way, fix that. They fixed that. After they lost to Tech, Rojo, Rojo calls the team meeting. Like, hey, man, let's go. This ain't, this, ain't, this ain't how we do business. This is not the standard of Texas football. It's just, and we're not going to get derailed this early in the season. We need to refocus. So they did. They fixed that leadership issue, and they fixed the blown leads. The biggest issue for Texas football in 2021, <clears throat> the fourth quarter. And in Sark's now two-year tenure, and we all like the trajectory of the program, Texas has not proven to be a four-quarter team. They're not a four-quarter team. They played one, two quarters in year one, <laughs> get up big, and then lose the lead. And they played three quarters last season. I'll give you give you a stat that backs that up. I'll be reaching for notes all the time. I got tons of them around here. I can't even let y'all see it on camera. But y'all don't want to see that. All right? Um, Texas outscored their opponents hundred and by 179 points combined in the first three quarters of the games last season. And but they were outscored in the fourth quarter. So you're playing three quarters again, right? Three quarters of football. You're not playing a complete, you know, four quarter game and overtime, whatever it takes. Texas Tech went to overtime and one score games. Texas two and five in one score games because those one score games essentially those are fourth quarter games. Got to find a way to win in the fourth quarter. Now, for for Sark, the reason that this is to me, the biggest issue for this team and them shifting the narrative and reaching expectations is because there's there's like four, I'm getting way too deep here, four, four true tenants on building a football program in an organization, period, right? Don't, don't, we got, we ain't gonna overcomplicate this thing. Talent acquisition, talent development, coaching, which is scheme, tactics, your whatever, you know I mean? That adjustments, you know, all those things. Your coverages, all the, all the things you're playing. That's that's coaching. Just throw all that in there. And then there's culture. All right? Let's look at Sark from that perspective. Let's check all those boxes. Talent. Let's look at talent acquisition. I mean, I looked at Pro Football Focus. They did all their all-conference preseason selections for every uh, football conference in the country. And they had Texas with them. They had – it was – three teams. They had Texas with the most conference, all conference selections preseason of any team in the country. Actually, Georgia was Georgia was third behind Clemson. But obviously, pro football focus and everything, but you get the point. It gives you perspective. Sark has done an amazing job of turning over this roster and upgrading the talent. All right, very quickly. Turning it out. 
So they had 18 selections uh, from the all conference teams, depending on, you know, um, which obviously they had three different teams. And I, I'm not going to go deep into those weeds. I'm just giving you a lot of context for it. They're really, really talented. Loaded. Look at the quarterback room alone. Matter of fact, we'll get back to that. Talent development. Really quickly. I mean, last year, I'll tell you right now, you got you no, know, I, I watch it. I break it down. No, the, the only one position regressed in my opinion, to be honest, it was wide receiver. And you know, I love wide receiver because hell, I was the first one to recommend Brendan Marion getting the damn job. I recommended Brendan Marion get the job at Texas when, um, hell, when Tom, when Tom Herman was still on the 40 acres, I was like, Hey, I gotta go hire this guy, man. This guy's legit. He's a real deal. So, yeah, I didn't really know that. Yeah, I, I figured that they would get better as a group, but they didn't. Xavier Worthy regressed a little bit. We know because of the hand injury, all that kind of stuff. And uh, overall, we didn't see, you know, Casey Kane was inconsistent. We didn't see the uh, linear trajectory of the wide receiver room. They were all over the place. Love us and Jay Witt, though. Don't we all love Jay Witt? So that was the only position, though, where I didn't see improvement. And in some positions, exponential improvement. You got to give them the defense alone. The defense was a historic turnaround. Guys, that defense was, it was porous. <laughs> All right. It was terrible, as Charles Barkley was saying in 2021. 2022, they turned it around. But a lot of the same guys, they were on that 2021 defense. And that to me is, that's development. We're seeing it firsthand. So I honestly, I'll check those two boxes right now. I'll check the talent acquisition, I'll check the talent development. Culture. Here's the thing about culture. And, and for, for Texas, you know, I do think there are a lot of examples of why the culture is really good. Right. You go look, first of all, I think you go look at the quarterback room. That's a good, and, and these days there's no way to, there's no way to separate NIL transfer portal and your culture. It's part of the deal now. I think it's tougher than that. I think it's tougher than ever to raise kids <laughs> in the social media age everybody's living in. And I think it's tougher than ever to cultivate a positive culture in college sports with everything going on. It's just this, it's tough. You got, you got a lot there, just like being a parent, there, there's a lot of things that could <laughs> d- distract your child or, you know, get your, take your child down the wrong path. I'm not a parent yet, by the way. Um, but, Getting back to it, same thing about the culture. And I've said, I've said this forever about Texas football, but it could be about Texas sports, period, right? Texas sports, period. It could be about, no, think about it. It could be about any, really any college sport right now. And I've said this forever, but I applied to Texas football. If, if you are looking for the right type of player, there's a great scene in the movie, um, was it Miracle? Kurt Russell about you know the the hockey team the national hockey the USA hockey team that pulled the big upset uh, where um, he's saying he's talking to the assistant coach assistant coach says because he gives him the roster the assistant coach says hey coach you're missing all the best players on this roster and Kurt Russell's character looks back at him and says. I'm not looking for the best players. I'm looking for the right players. I think that's how you got to approach it in the NIL transfer portal era. There are two types of Texas football players, but you can probably just say college athletes now, period. It used to apply just to Texas, but now I think it applies everywhere. Those who come to Austin to play at the University of Texas, and those who come to Austin to play for the University of Texas, two types. You want the latter, right? Because the guys who come to play at Texas, and I, I was in the locker room with a lot of these guys, they I don't think they want to know is what Texas can do for them. What can, what can Texas do for me? They just vampire squid sucking the, pro, the program dry. <laughs> what can I do for me? What can a donor do for me? What can the team do for me? What can y'all do? Well, hook me up. Give me more. Give me more. And there are certain guys like Rojo most recently and others like uh, Moro Ojimo that they are here because they want to do things for Texas. 
There's two types. And you can change. We can all evolve, right? Um, and it's almost like that old JFK quote, right? Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Ask not what the University of Texas can do for you, but what can you do for the University of Texas? And then the fans, they will embrace you and love you because they will recognize that you were one of those athletes that came here to play for Texas, not at Texas. At Texas, I'm on the ground. I'm at ACL because they I got to get the good tickets. Oh, and now the transfer port NIL, it's even worse. You got a lot of guys that want to play at Texas, but do you want to play for Texas? I do believe Sark's doing a good job of getting guys to play for Texas. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I do think he's doing a good job of that. So in terms of the culture, the culture is positive. You, you kept Malik Murphy around and there's an NIL right now. Open Doors, which is one of the companies that studies NIL transactions all over the country, says that Texas is the number one NIL compensation program in the country right now. Overall, that Texas is leading the NIL arms race in college football right now. And Stark has already established that if you, hey, if you hit the transfer portal, we don't want you to come back. We want you to hit transfer portal and go. So he's already establishing certain, you know, kind of rules to set up his culture. And good for him. But I think he's doing a really good job with that. I think it's tougher than ever. I couldn't do it right now if I was a coach. I guess and as some coaches are deciding they can't really do that. So the culture, I think you can check that box. That's three of the four boxes they were all checking going, hey, that's it. The sex is ready to roll. The fourth box. The fourth box. The fourth box is coaching. Scheme. Tactics. Strategy. Um, there is, I think, for, for Sark, there are certain strides that need to be made for him to take his coaching game to the next level. And Texas won't be a championship caliber team until that happens. And they said they got a lot of talent everywhere, but the coaching has to match it. I'm not saying the coaching hasn't improved. Like I said, I talked about how it improved, but now you're down to the one score games. Now it's a game of inches. Now we're down to the one score games, right? You were two and five last year in those one score games and go back to the fourth quarter and you had five losses. In four of the five losses, you failed to outscore or you were outscored by your opponent in the fourth quarter. You either outscored or failed to outscore your opponent in the fourth quarter. That's it. That's where we are. We're at the point now where you got to become a four-quarter team. And the reason I put a lot on Sark is because when you start looking at the advantages that schematically Sark can give you, and I think he, he does a good job with his scheme overall. But we all know there's a reason that Sark's teams dominate the first three quarters and what we've seen, and they don't in the fourth quarter. Because fourth, by the fourth quarter, all your script, all your preparation, all your game planning is done. It really, it, 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 mar- it matters very little. What matters the most in the fourth quarter is what you've observed and what you've been able, the knowledge and data you've been able to accumulate throughout the first three quarters that will then allow you to come up with almost a brand new scheme in the fourth quarter of how to either give yourself a tactical, strategic, or schematic advantage. And for Sark, my challenge would be, I need him to now become a chess master. I call it the chess match within the game. He's great. He's one of the best in the country at game planning and preparation. That's why you get the big leads. But then once he's off script, he's almost like a rapper that has to, if he ain't, if he ain't writing the lyrics down, you're asking a freestyle, he's like, I got nothing. <laughs> I can't freestyle. What do you mean? That's that's not really what I do. I'm not I'm not a freestyle guy. It's like, well, okay. So he's got to write it down. He on script, he's way better on script than he is off script. And by the fourth quarter, he's off script. So if you ask him, you know, to to participate on whose line is anyway, you know, we're talking about improvisation. Sark might not be the best, but he's a beast. He's a beast on script, a monster. But football oh, is basically played uh, maybe one and a half quarters on script. That's about how long your script will last. After that, you have to you have to counter what the adjustments are of your opponent. By then, your your opponents 
their, you know, their, their processing. All right. All the, the different force multipliers, all the different things you're using. And by that time we get off the script, they already know how you want to attack them, how you want to exploit them, where you think they're weak. Uh, they know exactly, uh, exactly what you believe is your like course to, to victory. They know all those things by then. You've you've gotten enough clues and hints as to how the team believes they can win the game. And then you have to adjust to that. And the, the opponent inevitably adjusts. This is the chess match now. And then I need Sark to come up with a counter. And he, he doesn't come up with creative counters. At times, he seems almost stupefied late in games about what to do to adjust. Last season, Texas had B. John Robinson and Rojo. That's how you win the Baylor game. That's how you win the Iowa State game. Essentially, Sark decides, hey, you know, the best solution is the simplest solution. Just give it to Bijan and Rojo. Y'all know my motto last season was what? Put some Bijan on it with a side of Rojo. Yeah. Hey, that would if, you, if you'd have stayed with that motto, hey, you, you'd have been all good. Bijan on it with a side of Rojo. And we didn't get that from, from Sark. Uh, we got it later on. He would kind of commit to it. I think late in the season, he decided this is definitely the way to go. Uh, but I think he came to that conclusion a little bit too late. But even though that he came to that conclusion, that's not necessarily a schematic, strategic, tactical advantage for me. That's just common sense. And God, Jabroni off the street could have told you that, who's a college football fan. I'll give you an example. Joey McGuire. Hate to bring up a Texas Tech example. Not, you know, I mean, I, Hey, I love the Texas Tech folks out there. Y'all got some beautiful women out there. All right. Um, can't get your guns up. Can't get your grades up. Get your guns up. That's what they always say. So I give him a hard time. But I like Joey McGuire. I think he's – and he's got something. Uh, you know, we don't know if he's a great coach or anything yet, but I, I like his strategy this season. So Texas Tech attempted 52 fourth down conversions. That's one of the highest numbers in the history of college football. It really is. Like it's really, really high. At least the highest since 2009. And Texas fans remember this all too well, right? So he attempts 52 all season. Because I think Jordan McGuire, by the way, who was around that 2021 team, remember he was around that team. So he got to know him and, you know, he had a real intimate knowledge of that roster and their limitations, you know, what they could accomplish, what they couldn't. And I think he looked at that roster and said, man, we got, we got some severe, you know, liabilities on this roster. And we got, you know, it, it, we got some, you know, there are some good athletes, but also, you know, we're going to be at a disadvantage in a lot of different ways. I got to find a way to give us a hidden advantage somewhere. I got somewhere in the margins. I got to give, I got to go get us some, some points on the board, or I got to go create some advantage for my team. This was the path he chose and he was extreme with it. They converted 63.4%, uh, 33 out of 52 of their fourth downs. But here's the interesting thing. So 129 points is basically the point total of the extended drives, all right, from their fourth down conversion. So their fourth down conversions, extended drives that led to 129 points. And if you subtract the points that also they gave up because they had turnovers on downs and sometimes they did not convert, and the other team would score as a result of that uh, mistake, or that failed conversion, they gave up 44 points. So you subtracted, you got about 85 points. And you yeah, might know that it's about six and a half points per game. Guys, they they beat Texas by three in overtime. They beat U of H by three in overtime. They beat Iowa State by four. And they beat Oklahoma by three in overtime. You probably could go back and say that he won his team two games. He was they were six of eight versus Texas uh, uh, on fourth downs. That he his strategy so extreme. It was extreme, extreme as a mofo. It was extreme, man. It was crazy. It was watching it. I think we're all like, he's going for the is he what is it doing really? Oh, what the everybody was stupefied, flabbergasted. What the hell? But that was early on. By the end of the season, he kept doing it. He was five and six versus Ole Miss, six and seven versus West Virginia. He had some games where it didn't work out really well for him, but kept on doing it. 
and it gave his team an advantage they otherwise wouldn't have had because Texas Tech, they have limitations. And for Texas, I'm trying to find that game. I'm trying to find that tactic and strategy for Sark where he identifies the problem and solves it in game. Solves it. Got to figure it out. And honestly, guys, we just haven't had a lot of examples of him figuring out those real time. One thing that, I, that my one of my favorite games for him that I'm talking about wins here. So don't give me the Bama game and the moral victories, guys. We don't do that. Please. <laughs> All right. So I, he, he coached a hell of a game in the Bama game, but we lost the game. All right. So talk about the wins. The last game I remember start giving his team that strategic advantage in a, a game where his team had was at a severe disadvantage, K-State 2021. Remember how much they ran the Wildcat? They just kept running the Wildcat over and over again. They ran the Wildcat over and over. They just kept, <laughs> it was just Rojo and the Wildcat. Bijan was hurt. Quarterbacks were hurt. Sark went on and won that game with a strategy. And like I said, he was extreme in that strategy. And that's one thing about Sark, too. You know, he... There will be concepts that work, but he'll use them sparingly. And I, and I think you should be an extremist once you find success. Just, I mean, if if they can't find a way to stop it, to me, you you keep picking at that sword. You pull at that damn thread so the whole damn thing unravels. And Sark doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. You guys know it. I, I have something I call playing the hits. How often do y'all remember seeing a really good play in the first half and you wonder, hey, man, that's a great play. Either worked or maybe it didn't work, or maybe there's a penalty, whatever. And he you, he never played, he never does it again. He never calls that play. And it's like, but, but just run it again at least in the second half when maybe you're out of ideas. Now, for Sark, like I said, and, and it's it's also tracks. I when I when I went back and looked at Sark's record versus coaches who win at least 60% of their games. Remember, that's the mark to make it into the Hall of Fame to win at least 60% of their games. When when Sark plays coaches who win at least 60% of their games because he's at 55%, I think maybe 56% if you round up. He has a winning percentage around 40%, hovering around 40%. Yeah. But when he plays, I'm oh, sorry, coaches against coach, uh, coaches who have a winning percentage lower than 60%, he has a, over a 75% winning percentage. He's trying to, when, he, when he's got a match wits with a chess master, he's losing the chess match within the game. When they have adjustments, he needs to have a counter. And my idea was essentially, I know we're getting way too deep into the weeds here, was, you know, you have the scripted plays. The scripted plays, we all know they're great. He's unbelievable in the scripted plays. One of the best in the country at game planning preparation. Unfortunately, that only lasts you a quarter and a half, maybe a half. All right. And, you know, he says he scripts the first 20 plays, I believe. And that's usually that's that's about normal. But his first 20 plays are fantastic. I mean, they really, I mean, that is a as a, you know, Quentin Tarantino script. That is Martin Scorsese. I mean, that, his first script is unbelievable. That is <laughs> that's, that script is money. We all know it's like, oh, we that's sort of script. It's like he is in the lab. You know, he's in his bag. He's creative. He's at the house. I don't know what he's doing in the house to get that script going, but we love it, and it's great. And that dries up by the fourth quarter. And I think by then, because like I said, by, by then you're off script. And my idea was let Kyle Flood, offensive coordinator, or you know whoever you wanted to do it, call the scripted plays. The reason scripted plays are so good is because you've been practicing scripted plays the whole damn <laughs> the whole damn week. Everybody knows exactly where to be, where to, hand placement, footwork. I've been practicing all week. I know exactly where to be on these plays. And these are plays specifically pinpointed to exploit the weaknesses of the opponent. They are, they are essentially the, the offensive coordinator is a uh, he's basically trying to, to, to find a combination to a lock. Right? He's trying to he's trying to break into a safe. He's a safe cracker. And the defense is the safe. And you're trying to, to somehow pinpoint exactly how you can break into this safe and you can either find a combination or find a way into it or around it. And that's what all that's basically what 
the script should be, a lot of it should be designed to do, to unlock the defense. You want to unlock it, right? And Sark, he does. He does a great job of unlocking the defense. But at one point, the defense adjusts and he's got to figure it out. So I think you should let Kyle Flood call the scripted plays because they're scripted. Who gives a damn? They're scripted. If something happens, un, you know, unexpectedly, then all right, take over the play call. And you always have to veto. But let him call those plays. Then you take notes like Mac Brown. You should do Mac Brown with his little little pad all the time. All right, Mac was always taking notes. <laughs> take some notes on what the defense is doing. All right, because he, he's head coach and play caller, so he's got a lot going on. You got in terms of game, game management. That's why I think they brought in, you know, all these special assistants. The last year they had one special assistant, Gary Patterson. Now they got hell three of them, and they might bring Gary Patterson back in another role. Hell, they might bring Rod B on as a special assistant. Everybody get to be a special assistant, and I'm all for give him more resources to help him manage the game because he gets lost a little bit. And I do think for, you know, you should go look at it uh, for Sark. He lets him call the plays and then he can examine what the defense is doing to adjust to his game plan. Then maybe he has better jump on essentially creating a second half game plan or script. That's one idea. Another idea, he can take it over when the script, of course, is done. Another idea is that, to try to figure it out because uh, nobody can kind of figure out. I mean, only Sark can do this thing on his own. I think Sark, and maybe he does this already, he needs his defensive minds on his team to reverse engineer all of his game plans before the game. It's, it's hubris in a way. You should just assume. Assume that your opponent is going to have a really good game plan. Assume their game plan is better than your game plan. For, just for the, the, the hypothetical, for the sake of the thought experiment. As a coach, you should do that right before the game. Your game's on Saturday, have it on Friday. You and your boys sit around, kick it a little bit and go, all right, man, y'all know my game plan. I need y'all to, 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 uh, to, I need y'all to take it apart, rip it to shreds, all right? I need y'all to find every loophole, every way to circumvent this, this offensive game plan I got. And then when they give you all their different adjustments, a, B, C, D, E, F, G. You come up with counters for every one. And then at least in the game, there's a pretty good chance defensive minds kind of think alike. They're going to be thinking along the same lines. And then you can have, oh, oh, you did A? Okay, I was already ready for A. I got a creative counter ready to go. <laughs> we got it. Oh, they decided to shift this coverage. We knew it. I knew they were going to shift the coverage. Let's go. We're ready. It, 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 sound, it sounds too simple. So I'm sure something like that's already happening. Sounds too simple. But you got to figure out a way to remedy that because if you don't, that's how Sark takes the – that's how he takes his game as a coach to the next level. And Texas won't be, like I said, a great team and a championship team until they do that. And he's also got to figure out some other things. We'll, we'll get into football theory one-on-one everything, but, guys, the three high, three down defense, Sark's got to figure that out too. He's got to become a chess master. That was my last rant, but he's also got to figure out the three high, three down. We'll get into that a little bit later on. He's got to – I, I, my notes tell me that when he faces a three high, three down defense, his offense is average uh, over eight points fewer per game. Yeah. It's, it's his kryptonite. I, 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 I'll, I'll tell you schematically why it matches up well, why it's almost compatible with his offense, but it's his kryptonite. It is. He's got to figure that out. He's got to be working on that too in the lab. He did a better job on it in 2022 20, uh, versus, but still, Still some subpar performances. And if you're a defensive coordinator, that's definitely the defense to run versus Sark. All right. I went on for a minute. Man, uh, that flew by. These three hours going to be easy. <laughs> See, the truth is, people don't know. I had two talents in my life. This is my advice to the kids out there. Got two talents. I can run fast. I can talk fast. Make careers out of them both. That's it. You know what I mean? I can do it. All right, we come back. How about this? We're going to switch it up. We got to switch it up. We got to talk about the Big 12 and the Pac-12. So we'll get into some conference realignment on the other side. Uh, I'll tell you why the Pac-12, why they are the blockbuster video <laughs> of college conferences. All right, let's take a breath. Let's take a break. Uh, my man Blake behind the scenes hooking us up. We appreciate him. Let's take a break. Let's do it. Three, two, one. <laughs> This Orange Bloods recruiting flashback focuses 
on one of the most infamous recruitments of the last decade, a recruitment that ended with what has forever been remembered as Malikmas. Malik Jefferson was a five-star prospect by rivals when he signed with the Longhorns, finishing as the nation's number 28 overall prospect, the second best prospect in Texas, and the number one outside linebacker in the country, according to Rivals.com. While Jefferson is sometimes remembered for never quite emerging as a superstar for the Longhorns, look at who was ranked ahead of him in these 2015 in-state rankings and just below him. While Kyler Murray should have been the number one prospect in retrospect, Jefferson was easily the best of the top kids in the rivals rankings that year. What most people remember about the Jefferson recruitment is that it was a close victory over Texas A&M and seemed to launch the Charlie Strong era into the stratosphere. For most of the recruiting process, Jefferson was leaning heavily to Texas A&M. But when the Aggies went through a defensive coordinator search following the 2014 season, Jefferson and A&M coach Kevin Sumlin had a bit of a disagreement connect as someone wasn't very open with his plans for a hire which jefferson felt was critical information to any decision that he was going to make that disconnect opened the door for strong to step in when jefferson made his announcement on december 19th six days from christmas strong was able to completely swing the recruitment into ut's direction jefferson chooses the university of texas at austin <laughs> Jefferson was part of a 2015 recruiting class that finished 12th in the nation in the final Rivals.com rankings in what turned out to be Charlie Strong's first full recruiting class as coach of the Longhorns. All right, welcome back. Oh, I like those. Those are cool. My, my man Blake and those behind the scenes doing great work and appreciate all the kind words uh, over there on the uh, the chat. We appreciate all you guys supporting us. We appreciate you guys sitting in. Uh, we're going to be here for three hours, so really appreciate that. Uh, oh, man. L, got a super chat. We appreciate that. There you go. Oh, who's that? It's my man. Oh, who's that, Russ? Man, my eyes are bad. That's crazy. I can barely see it. I got to pull, pull it up. Send me on the private chat, Blake, send me the name to make sure I get the name right. I want to make sure I get their name right so I can hook them up. It is Russ. All right. Thank you, Russ. Russ, you're the man. I really appreciate that, man. I really do. And you got any questions, Russ, you got something you want to throw out there, I'll let me. All right. Send me a super chat. Boom. We'll, we'll let it take over the show. Oh, I got another one. Oh, okay. Got another one from Rand. All right. Um, has Coach Sark done enough to make you a believer yet? I'm still on the fence. Yes. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, real quick, I'll say this, right? Because Texas has had basically, you know, affluenza, <laughs> the football program's version of affluenza lately, right? You got a lot of money, a lot of resources, a lot of talent, uh, but yet underachieving. I think Sark's done a great job. Um, and I actually, am I a Sark believer yet? I'm not a, a total Sark believer yet. I need to see it this season. Because the truth is, Sark still hasn't won double-digit games Sark still hasn't won a, a conference championship. And by the way, I'm not saying he didn't improve teams everywhere he went. And there's not a lot of great things we can say about him, including what he's done here at Texas. And this is the most talent he's had and the best coaching staff he's had. And he's made a lot of the right moves. Yet, I still, I need to see him win those big games. And I need to see him make the in-game adjustments that I just brought up. Just real quick. Okay. Because we're talking about those in-game adjustments. Think about this, guys. Um. In that TCU game, I know Sark saying they knew the, you know, they they knew some of the signals and all that kind of stuff. But by the way, another team knowing your your signs, that is a you problem. That also that also shows me that you as a coach are a little ill prepared for the transfer portal era. With the transfer portal era, everybody's got to be changing signs all the time because all, everybody's changing teams. That's crazy. But eh, know, that story being out there, I'm like, man, that makes them look bad another way. But anyway. Even if TCU knew the signs, even if they knew all the signs, you still gave B. John Robinson, the best player on either team, 12 touches and zero targets. Come on. Zero targets? Zero targets? And it turns out, what was TCU doing? Stacking the box. They stacked the box. What I, this is what I always say about stacking the box. Football is a, it's a simple game. People try to make it simple. Uh, you know, uh, you try to overcomplicate it. It's not. 
if somebody, it's a, it's a numbers game. It's a rudimentary level. It's a numbers game. 11 on 11. It's chess with people. If they got, if they're stacking the box and they're winning the numbers game in the box, then they're losing it on the perimeter. You can only win the numbers game one place at a time. <laughs> you can't win. It's vice 11. Can't win it. You can't, you know, it is no, you got to choose where you want to win the numbers advantage. And for Sark to realize late in that game, oh, you know what? Let's get out to Jay Witt on the perimeter. We got the numbers out there. Yeah. 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 Do it sooner. Make that move sooner. Jay, then they should have adjusted to Jay Witt and put numbers out there. And then it opens up some stuff inside. Also, target Bijan. So there are some, uh, there's some, decisions where I yeah, let's take Oklahoma State, Texas, Oklahoma State. What was that? What was that? Now we know that that Xavier Worthy had a, a half broke hand. So you had a and then we know Quinn Ewers hand was also messed up. So we know you had a one handed man throw into a one handed man in double coverage. <laughs> Jay Witt had to be like, what? Well, hold up. Hold up. Uh, they double covering. My guy, I got one-on-one. -on -one. Nope. Keep throwing it to X-Men. That, that, that 14 overthrows. And we're like, well, yeah, I didn't know his hand was messed up. You got Vijan Robinson back there and Rojo too, right? You got both? Okay, just check. So there's some decisions. Even in the Washington game, Quinn Ewers had a good game. But to run the same run plays you're, you run with Bijan and Rojo with Keelan Robinson and a hobbled Jonathan Brooks, Where's the creativity? Where's innovation? You don't have you don't have two of the best running backs in the country, two NFL running backs. Made up both of them going up starting in my opinion one day in the league, and yet and they will both they both will be underpaid. We know that too. <laughs> uh, but I digress. Why are you acting like Keelan Robinson is a main course running back? No man, he's a he he's a side dish. He's the mashed potatoes. He's the mac and cheese. He's the fried okra. He ain't the big piece of chicken or the pork chop. That's Jay Brooks. That's somebody else. You know, that ain't Keelan. Not nothing against Keelan. He's some tasty, he's some tasty ass mashed potatoes with gravy, but he ain't the main course running back. Come on. And you went to the game like that? Come on, man. So I still got some questions. My fault. Y'all got me started. Y'all should have done that. That's, that's on y'all. All right. We had one more. I, I thought we had one more on the super chat. I apologize. I go off too much. This is gonna be an everyday thing with this. Oh, Dax, are we getting Colin Simmons? Will he be worth it? Uh, we worth the money. Yeah, they they need. This is the kid that's a true edge rusher. It, 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 yeah, they should. Listen, if you are if you want to declare yourself the NIL capital of college sports, which the BMDs, shout out to the big money donors and boosters out there, baby. Uh, they have informed me that's what they want Texas to be. And right now they are winning that arms race in the NIL, but it's a race, so you can't stop. You got to keep it going. Yeah, this is this. You got to get one of these. You got to you got to make this happen. You got to get one of these type of prospects. And once the last time Texas had a great edge presence, like a true edge presence, it's been, you know, it's been a while. I like you know the way they are overshone off the edge, and I like. Uh, the thought of Anthony Hill off the edge, but a, a true edge rusher. It's been a while. All right. Thank you guys for the super chat. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate super chat. Y'all yeah, see, shout out to wifey who set this up in the background. Boom. Got the helmet and everything. Oh, how about this? Real, real quick story. Okay. So wifey takes the helmet out. She takes this helmet out and it's got a lot of scuffs on it, right? It's got scuffs everywhere, right? It's got battle. You got battle marks on here. She was going to break out like some type of sponge and clean off the marks off the helmet. And I had to tell this woman, baby, you can't, no, you get to leave that on there. That's Oklahoma State. That's Texas Tech. That's, uh, that's Oklahoma. The marks, they mean some. Come on. All right. I put that back. Oh, and wifey just walked in, so I need to stop talking trash. All right, there you go. All right. Let's put that back up there. If I get enough money on Super Chat, I'll do the show in the helmet. How about that? <laughs> All right. I got to get back on track here, y'all. All right. So let's talk about the Big 12. And I'll tell you why 
Klyovkov is pulling the Bosby, y'all. I don't know what's going on, but he's pulling the Bosby. Okay, here about this is 2021 was the last Big 12 media days that Bob Bosby was the actual commissioner of the Big 12. I'm going to read you a quote from Bob Bosby, a very arrogant Bob Bosby at the time. All right, this is actually a quote from him in, in regards to realignment. They asked him, this is his last, this is his last Big 12 uh, media days as commissioner, and this quote is why. At the time, he said, <clears throat> a lot of the motivation for realignment is no longer there. Is that to say it couldn't happen? No, it could possibly happen for other reasons, but it doesn't appear to me that the motivation is there at this point in time. Uh, then he said, not to say it couldn't happen, uh, but it's not one of those things that keeps me up at night. Uh, 11 days later, after those comments, it was announced that Texas and Oklahoma were going to the SEC. Klyovkov at Pac-12 Media Days this year. This is a, these are real Klyovkov quotes. Um, he says, we're on track to announce our deals uh, about the same time as everyone would have anticipated. Our patience will be rewarded. I tell you what, we've seen this, that the longer we wait for the media deal, the better our options get. And I think our board realizes that. Wow. He also said, it's another damning quote from him. He also said, <laughs> um, I think the realignment that's going on in college athletics will come to an end for this cycle. That's exactly what Bowlesby was doing. He's pulling the Bowlesby. He's pulling the Bowlesby right now. And they just introduced their latest media rights deal, or at least the proposal for the Pac-12 media rights deal. And uh, yeah, it looks like it's been reported that it's in the low 20s. Uh, the presentation actually featured at least two proposals, one less lucrative than the other. Uh, and, and a lot of it's dependent on subscription-based incentives as well. And um, right now, I, that Apple deal, that must be the best of the deals that was offered. And it's below the Big 12 share um, uh, revenue sharing deal, which is about 32 million, which is what I believe Colorado got. So I don't know what's going to happen next in the, the Pac-12. I assume Arizona, Arizona State, Utah, those reportedly all the schools right now that are in most contact with the Big 12, or maybe there are some officials uh, that are in contact from the Big 12. But Klyovkov, there's so, and you know, it's not just Klyovkov. It is Larry Scott and Klyovkov. We're talking about back-to-back -back bad leadership by both of those 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 guys they really it, they really screwed up a good thing in the Pac-12 and come to find out multiple times we now know the Pac-12 had a chance to dissolve the Big 12 in 2011 when the first round of realignment for the Big 12 uh took of course Colorado to the Pac-12 and then Texas A&M went to the SEC along with Missouri it it said here this is a quote from Larry Scott at the time, who was the conference commissioner of the Pac-12. When he was asked about trying to unify with the Big 12 or to poach teams from the Big 12, he said, we could have expanded at the time, but the deal didn't make any sense at the end of the day for us. There is a very high bar. It's hard to imagine very many scenarios for our conference to expand because the bar is so high. Essentially saying our bar is a little too high for Oklahoma State and Texas Tech. You know, you know, Texas and Oklahoma, I will take them. But since that fell through, we don't necessarily want those other schools. And that probably was a dang coaching mistake. You could have weakened the Big 12 even further. And then come to find out, Bob Bowlesby, got to give him credit for this one. Two years ago, after Texas and Oklahoma announced their departure for the SEC, Bob Bowlesby reached out to Klyovkov and offered to merge and share media rights package and establish a scheduling alliance. And the Pac-12 refused a merger and then decided against expansion on the other end of that. Talk about multiple bad decisions on top of bad decisions. And turns out, this is, I just got, I just found this yesterday. I mean, Pete Thamel threw this out there. Last July, uh, the Big 12 officials fielded a call from Klyovkov after USC and UCLA announced their departure. And apparently this was an attempt to merge. He wanted to take Bowlesby up on his offer. 
uh, or at least take uh, the new commissioner, Brett Yarmark, up on Bosby's offer, I should say. Uh, it was declined by um, Bosby. Uh, declined by, uh, I should say, not Bosby, but Brett Yarmark. So it multiple times this thing could have gone wrong. And the Big 12, it's amazing that a year ago, a year ago, the Big 12 was so fragile that we all assumed it's the Big 12 or the Pac-12, and it could go either way. As a matter of fact, the Pac-12 had a better shot at survival because the Big 12 was weak after Texas and Oklahoma left, and they had no leadership. And he went out and got Brett Yarmark. Home run hire. That was a home run of a hire to go out there and get Brett Yarmark. And and now getting Colorado back into the fold. Say what you want about Colorado. Colorado is kind of an it university. I, I, attend, I went to the University of Colorado for an official visit. And I thought about attending University of Colorado because at the time the football program was an it program. I mean, you had a lot of great players coming out of Colorado. And I was, it turns out I went to Texas and I'm happy about my decision. But it wasn't too long ago where Colorado was still considered an it university. Cool to teenagers. And now it is, again, mostly because of Deion Sanders. <laughs> and I'm a big Deion fan. And you guys know I wore number 21. And a big reason I wore number 21 is because of Deion. And now Deion has led to... Um, seven hundred percent growth in merchandising sales. Uh, they got a hundred and a seven hundred twenty-two percent growth in Instagram followers. They sold out the spring game. They added on ESPN. Sold out two home games. First time they've done that since twenty nineteen. And they sold out of season tickets. And they're gonna play their first two games this season on national TV. And they got into the Big Twelve. Even when Dion was out there, I said, "Man, you should hire Dion because even if he fails, he's gonna fail." Like forward, you know what I mean? Like your program will be better off, even if he fails. It doesn't he, he, say he wins like three, four, five games a year. He's gonna recruit like gangbusters, and your profile is gonna go through the roof, through the roof. Everybody's gonna be talking about you. You cannot put a price on the amount of free media you get with Deion Sanders as your as your ambassador of your program. He's going to go into Big 12 Media Days next year, and they're not going to be talking about Texas and Oklahoma leaving. They're going to be talking about Dion because he's going to be in there probably with a, a band behind him. They're going to be dancing or whatever. Going to come in there riding on something clean, whatever it may be, some golf cart. He's going to make a show of it, and that's what you want, even if it fails miserably. So the free media, I think, is important to keep in mind there. Um, hell, some people would argue free media, that's – how Donald Trump won the election, free media, all right? There's a lot of free media there, man. Six billion dollars of free media in that election because we ate it up. He was on the news all the time. Texas football's best advertisement free media is the horns down. I'll never do it. See, I, 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 the closest I got was like that. I'll never do it. Uh, but it was horns down. People, everybody knows what horns down mean. You ain't got to explain it to people. And get used to it, Longhorn fans. You're going to see a lot of it in the SEC. They will, you're going to see more horns down than you've ever seen in your life. It's going to become a religion for all them people. Aggies are already doing it. Arkansas does it. Oklahoma does it. They're going to be doing it all over the SEC. So just get used to it. Consider it a compliment. Hell, I was once flagged for doing the horns up in, like a, in the two-lane game. So I was taunting the opponent, which is ridiculous. Um, but the horns down isn't an insult, guys. It, it, on the contrary, it's basically um, the – College football's version of the middle finger. It, everybody knows what that symbol means. It is the best version of free media in all of college sports right now. Anyway, I digress. Getting back to it, there's a there's a great little nugget that I learned about Netflix. Netflix is now worth like 191 billion dollars, on its way to 200 billion dollars. Biggest one of the biggest streaming platforms in the world. And we're old, and some of y'all are old enough, like me. Some of y'all are older. Remember when Netflix was still mailing, <laughs> they were mailing DVDs, all right, in the mail, trying to send it to people. Yeah, some of y'all remember that. I, hey, I, I remember them days. At that time, the, <laughs> the company Blockbuster, Blockbuster Video, which doesn't exist anymore, had a monopoly on home entertainment pretty much. It was just everybody was going to Blockbuster Video to get to the movies before you know they came on cable because it took a while for things to come on cable back then. Now, with streaming, 
stuff goes from the theater. Sometimes I don't even go to the theaters. So, but if it does, it doesn't take long for it to be available for you to stream, or you can just go buy it on some streaming app different days. But at that time, Blockbuster Video actually had a chance to buy Netflix for $50 million. In 2000, year 2000, $50 million. They had a chance to buy Netflix, and they refused. They kind of scoffed at it. It was like, nah, I don't want it. You know, we're good. We don't need it. We're, we're, it. We've monopolized home entertainment. We're Blockbuster. People love to get off of their comfortable couch, go out to a store, buy overpriced candy, and have to and hope and pray that the movie they want, the new brand new movie that just came out, is still on the shelves by the time they can get to Blockbuster. Oh, we all dream of those days. That Blockbuster video card. <laughs> but they had a chance to buy it. They scoffed at it. It's like, nah, man, we don't, no, we don't need that. We're Blockbuster video. And now, of course. We know how the story ends. That's the Pac-12. The Pac-12 had numerous, numerous opportunities to dissolve the Big 12. Tons of opportunities to dissolve the Big 12. They could have did it, you know, back when uh, yeah, Texas A&M left and Missouri, the first little exodus, they could have done it then. Larry Scott didn't want to do it. Klyovkov had a chance to do it when Texas Oklahoma left. It was a very weak conference. Didn't have great leadership. Bowlesby was still the leader. The Michael Scott of conference commissioners, he was still the leader at the time. That was a big issue too, you know, because you had bad leadership. Your leadership without vision. He wasn't. He had no. He had no vision for the future. That's why Texas left the Big Twelve. It wasn't necessarily a money issue. He was like, what about the money? Yeah, you get a lot more money, but Texas is gonna get money. Texas prints money. All right, they got a right underneath the uh, tower. They a little print press there. They just print it. What did Ray McCombs say? Texas got more money than everybody except the Catholic Church. He ain't lying. <laughs> he ain't lying. Catholic Church got a lot of money, though. Um, but you get the point. Money, money's secondary to Texas. A lot of institutions have to operate that way. Remember, Oklahoma couldn't even pay their exit fees. Texas was like, man, can we pay this Oak Cross? Can we pay it in cash? Do we get y'all want it in cash? How y'all want it? 20s? What y'all want? <laughs> you know, it, it, money ain't no big thing. What Texas needed was leadership. They needed leadership in the ever-changing, ever-evolving world of college sports now, NIL. Unprecedented, unprecedented, uncharted waters. We've never been here before. NIL, transfer portal, conference realignment, college football uh, playoff expansion. Every minute, there's, there's never been this much change in college sports in such a compressed time span. Usually this stuff happens over decades. Y'all know NCAA moved at a glacier-like pace. And now it's happening quickly, so you need true, real leadership. I'm talking about legit. You need somebody who's a visionary. And Greg Sankey was that guy. And they go, this guy's behind, behind Bob Bosley's back. At the time, Texas and Oklahoma are plotting this exodus. Bob Bosley's on the college football playoff committee with Greg Sankey. He's on there. Greg Sankey's looking at this dude every day. Like, not every day, but whenever they meet up, I don't know, every other week or so. They were in Dallas, I believe, is where they met up. And he was looking at Bob Bosley going, man, this dude had no idea. Damn shame. Hmm. It is kind of cold-blooded. It's, it's some secession, Game of Thrones type cold-bloodedness going on. All right? And you had, I mean, so you had bad leadership. Yeah, someone says, remember we hired Steve Madison, whatever his name was? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a bad hour. But okay, you you guys want to know my theory about that, John? My theory is that because Texas is Texas is a pretty savvy institution. They really are. I believe still to this day, because Steve Patterson, if you go look at his history, he had a he was that guy. He he was always a bit of a crotchety a-hole, uh, you know, with folks, even in this time in pro sports, people didn't necessarily like Steve Patterson. He wasn't well liked and he wasn't seen as a people person, a great communicator. I think Texas, but my this is my theory. I'm on a grassy no. I think they brought him in as a hatchet man. He's a hatchet man. They need they, they needed to fire some folks. All right. Stevie P was willing to do it. Every, other guys weren't willing to do it. They had some other Oliver Love was like, I ain't coming in firing people. No, man. Yeah, no. Look, let's go with the guys, the hatchet man. And I believe he understood that. And that's it. That's why. And think about it, he also upped some of the, the prices on things too. I don't, they just started discounting it after he left. I call him OG Stevie P. 
Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Some of them got beer in the stadium. I'm, I'm sure he's did some good things. He was brought in as a hatchet man. They needed somebody to come in and chop, get it done. That's just my theory. Anyway, getting back to it, though, the reason they that, that Texas went with the SEC is because Greg Sankey is a visionary. He's got a vision, and he's got a plan for how to execute the vision. Bob Bowlesby is far from that. Klyovkov, far from that. Brett Yarmark, all of that. That dude's what 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 that dude's done in just a year. Circumvented the Pac-12, went around them and got his deal done before the Pac-12, and now is expanding. He's been on the job a year. He's already he got a. They're, they're going to play international games in Mexico City, football and basketball. They're going to play have a tournament in Rucker Park. An exhibition, uh, you know, I think classic in Rucker Park where Texas uh, will play there. It's, I mean, he's, he's done a lot in a short amount of time. And, you know, and Klyovkov, you know, he was, I, I think he was a hire for like MGM or something like that. So he was an outside the box hire too, but it didn't work out the same as it did for Brett Yarmark. So I agree with the strategy. When you're hiring for a big job like that, they always say, you, when you're hiring for a big job like that, you want to hire either an alien or a dinosaur. Right, you're hiring for a high level position, uh, leadership position like that. You either want somebody who is old and wise and knows the terrains, been around, acclimated to their ecosystem, adapted to it, knows where all the you know the predators are, knows where the prey is. They're just well seasoned, they've been there, done that. That's your dinosaur. But the aliens got one thing the dinosaur does not have, and that is perspective the 30,000 foot view of everything going on and because that dinosaur has been you know programmed in that ecosystem for so long he doesn't answer and ask the same questions as the alien so why the when the you know dinosaur you know is presented with a problem sometimes he'll ask why and the alien will ask why not and brett your mark is an alien the best kind not the kind he's talking about uh in capitol hill <laughs> Y'all realize that we don't care about the, the, them talking about aliens uh, landing. and Anyway, I'm not getting into all that. Maybe one day we'll get into all that, but not right now. Uh, so we'll, we'll wait on that. Okay. <laughs> there is a, There are a ton of other things that I want to get to. Um, we were late on the break. I was supposed to take a break. And I just kind of kept moving through it. Uh, as long as I'm not supposed I don't have to do one, then uh, I guess we can just go on to the next one. So one thing do I, I, I do want to get back into, though. We were just talking about uh, the Big 12 and the conference overall. I, I, for Texas this season, I do think it's interesting for Sark that for the first time since 2009, that the expectation has matched the standard of Texas football. I tell people this all the time don't let your expectations affect the standard. The standard is the standard. The standard is a very high standard. It is sometimes unrealistic. Let's be honest here. I, I played at Texas. I was on some really good teams. We won 11 games, two years. And essentially, those seasons were failures. They were. I, I can talk about this realistically. We didn't beat Oklahoma. That's the number one thing. You got to beat Oklahoma, especially back then. We didn't beat Oklahoma in those years. Still won a lot of games. Didn't beat Oklahoma and didn't compete to win the Big 12 title. It didn't compete in one of those years. I think we played in, but you get my point. Still should win the Big 12 title. We were talented enough to not only win Big 12 titles, but compete for national titles. We actually had that much talent by the end of my time, 01, 02. We had stockpiled a ton of it. And we fell short of the standard. Uh, our expectations were the standard at that time, which were competing for championships and hell, 11 wins. That just comes with it. Now, I'm not saying we should throw that expectation on this team at all, but just so you understand what the standard is. Like I said, <laughs> I, I won 11 games and that was disappointment because the team was capable of more. The ceiling was higher. And I think for Longhorn fans now to have dealt with the last 13 years, I believe it is, 
that they've lowered. Some people lower the standard. Don't lower the standard. You lower your expectations. Don't lower. Don't mess with the standard. That's my standard too. I bled for that standard. I, you know what I mean? I sweated for that standard. That's part of my standard too. That's part of it. That's the, that's the pressure. You're supposed to win double digit games and beat Oklahoma. Check, check. And then go compete for championships. Check. And I didn't do that enough on teams that I played on. I carry that. That's that's a disappointment. Like I said, can there be an 11 win disappointment? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there, could be, there could be an 11 win disappointment. That it that sounds crazy. That that sounds, but that's the truth, guys. That's the standard. So my is my lesson is don't let your expectations affect the standard. A lot of, lot of folks play their butt off, sweat, bled for that standard. It is what it is. If you ain't meeting it, you ain't meeting it. It's okay. Doesn't mean your season's a failure. It was a failure for us because we were capable of winning a national title. We had first round picks. We had draft picks all over the damn place. For us, it was different. Now, because the expectation level is a little different. Now for this year, for Sark, now you're getting back to what he's at the standard. What it what how many? I mean, if Texas doesn't win double digit games this year, I think we all agree. Sark fell short. Somehow, some way. Even if there's a quarterback issue, and by the way, you've had to use two quarterbacks most of the time. There's a quarterback issue. Malik Murphy looks like he can handle it. Looks like he can handle it. So that's not even an excuse. It is truly the no excuses tour. That we had that. Well, I had those years. 01 and 02 were my years like that. There were no excuses. We were too damn good. We were loaded. Loaded with talent all over the place. One 11 games. Still didn't meet the standard, though. Sorry. Sorry, guys. So, yes, Texas has not met the standard in a really long time. 09 was the last time. I'm not saying it back. 2018. Sorry, Sam. My bad. Legendary lifetime long one. They met it in 2018. That's the standard. But you got it once. Basically, if you want to look at it, and I, I went and found this stat because it is a mind-blowing stat. I don't even like looking at it, but it's real. <laughs> uh, if you go look at Texas in the last 13 years, uh, this stat comes from Best Odds. One of the best college football bets to make over the last 13 years is the under on Texas win totals. Since 2010, Texas has gone under its preseason win total in 12 of the last 13 seasons. They don't, that's not the, so they're not reaching the standard at all. Just once, like I said, 2018 since then. So this is the first year where we're, Challenging Sark and that team to meet the standard. And it's, it's a tough one. It's, it, it really is. I, I'll admit now, like, it's a tough standard, but that's – don't co don't come to Texas. Don't go to Texas. And Sark – that's why I love that Sark's embracing it. He's embracing the expectations, embracing the hate. Go ahead. If you don't embrace it, then it's going to overwhelm you. It's, it's – you know, it's going to get the best of you. No, embrace it. Let's go. I, I remember we embraced it. We wanted our model to be because Mac has a team model every year. Uh, team model every year. Uh, so Mac has a team model every year. My, Mac, Mac's team motto, uh, I believe my last year was wit, whatever it takes. Mac switched it. It was supposed to be fit, which is effort. And Mac decided, nah, we go, it'll, it'll be wit. And it it would have been our thing, Costa Nostra. It'd been our thing. Nobody else would have known what it meant. Fit, they could have. Taken from that, whatever they wanted to. Uh, but that was our attitude. And Mac, no, nah, he's like, whatever it takes. So, <laughs> but our, the effort was we knew the expectations were high. Hell, Chris Sims was the starting quarterback. You know, we major was, you know, still there uh, in that 01, but 02, that was Sims's team at that time. He was throwing to a first round wide receiver and some really good weapons. And all of those guys that ended up winning that national title, they came as youngsters during that time. That's when you get a young VY coming on campus with the swag. And so I remember when it shifted, where that's when the standard became set. My first two years, I think we won nine games. And then those two 11 win seasons, it was, it was to, to, so everybody understood or in that locker room. Guys, 11 wins, that's not enough, though. 
Just so you know, it ain't enough. And that next group, they understood the assignment. It wasn't enough. Go beat Oklahoma. Go go win double-digit games. Go compete for championships. There you go. And you need your quarterback to ball out to do it. So it's going to be a big part of it, too, with Sark and development of Quinn Ewers. So I just want to throw that out there. The expectation versus the standard. You got to establish that early on. All right, I guess I should take a break. Let's take a break. Let's take a break because I've been going probably for like 30 minutes. So I'm going to gather some notes and we'll get into another topic. I want to talk about something the NFL did. Did these you know, the, the NFL billionaires, they're always thinking three, four, five steps ahead and a lot of different topics. And whether we're talking about Lionel Messi or, or Patrick Mahomes or, hell, we're talking about Candy cigarettes, <laughs> the equivalent of candy cigarettes. I'll, I'll put all that together, but that's what we'll get into next. The NFL billionaires did something under the radar. You have to be reading some type of sports business journal, all right, of some type of kind, some business journal to even find the story. And they did it because of Lionel Messi. And I'll talk about that when we come back right here. We'll get into this. Uh, all right, my man Blake, behind the scenes, let's take a breath. Let it breathe in three, two, one. This Orange Bloods recruiting flashback focuses on the answer to a long overdue trivia question. Who was the last five-star defensive tackle signed by the Texas Longhorns? The answer, Brenham defensive tackle Malcolm Brown out of the 2012 recruiting class. Brown finished as the nation's number 26 overall prospect, the fourth best player in the state of Texas, and the number five defensive tackle in the country, according to Rivals.com. In a year when the Longhorns signed four of the top seven prospects in Texas, Jonathan Gray, Kendall Sanders, Caleb Jones, and Brown, only Brown emerged as a true success as injuries and off-field incidents left scars on the entire 2012 recruiting class for the Longhorns. Early in Brown's recruitment going into his junior season, Texas A&M was a big leader. In fact, he told Orange Bloods that, quote, it's close to home and I would like to go there. It's in the Big 12. There's some opportunities for me to go there and do some stuff on the defensive line. A year later, Brown was a Texas commitment, along with teammate Tim Cole, who committed on the same day in what turned out to be a massive head-to-head -head win over the Aggies. Brown told OrangeBloods.com on the day he committed, basically, I want to be a Longhorn and I want to get a good education. Brown didn't earn his fifth star until his strong performances in the Under Armour All-America game after his senior season, which forced rivals' hands in the rankings process. Brown was a member of the 2012 recruiting class that finished second in the nation in the Rivals.com rankings, but was one of the biggest recruiting disasters in school history. Of the 28 players signed in the class, only Brown, Hassan Ridgeway, Duke Thomas, and Marcus Johnson played on Sundays. Most of the guys in that class never came close to the kind of success that Brown enjoyed throughout his career. All right, welcome back, guys, to the broadcast. Okay, so I want to get into this a little. It's, it's it's a story that took me down a rabbit hole, and you guys will learn. I go rabbit holing all the time. Turn into a verb, man. I go rabbit holing all the time. One time it leads me somewhere else, then boom. Uh, we just I just gotta let it go and let it go wherever the evidence takes me. That's where I like to go, like a like a true detective. True detective. If you haven't seen first season of True Detective with Matthew McConaughey and Woody Harrison. It's got to randomly throw that out there and recommend that. Just, it was one of the, it was one of the first glimpses of the McConaissance. One of the first glimpses of it. That's uh, when you first started to, if you have, I mean, that's that and pretty much the Dallas Buyers Club. That's his, you know, that to me, that was his masterpieces. I, I mean, that, that True Detective season one was fantastic. So anyway, random uh, recommendation, getting back to it. So, the story I want to get to is starting with Lionel Messi, who's going to make like $50 million to like $60 million this year with Inter Miami. It's been a great story, even if you're not a soccer fan. I mean, it's worth it. If you're a fan of business or you're a fan of sports in uh, overall or in general, it's a great story to follow. So he's basically going to be the highest paid U.S. athlete when it's all said and done because he's got revenue sharing deals with Apple, Adidas, 
fanatics. So he's going to get a piece, a serious piece of the straight cash, homie. Uh, how about this? Uh, the, 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 the Chicago Fire, uh, they play like 17 home games this season. Their one game against Lionel Messi at Inter Miami is going to drive more ticket revenue uh, than their other 16 games combined. Because everybody wants to go see Messi. <laughs> Crazy. All right. Crazy. Anyway, okay. So, the story. So, Messi's getting a lot of attention. And as well, he should. You're talking about potentially the best uh, soccer player on the planet and one of the most known athletes on the planet. And his effect, just his impact, has been unbelievable. Just to give you a little bit of an example of his impact, of Messi's impact so far, just on the social media alone, now into Miami is the 12th most followed uh, U.S. sports team on Instagram. Within just a couple of weeks of him getting on it, they, they are now up to 12 million, at least maybe in the last couple of weeks this might have changed, but up to 12 million uh, the Cleveland Cavaliers and the Lakers and the Warriors are the only three teams on Instagram that have more. That's crazy. And that's all for Messi. He's added 11 million followers on Instagram. He's got 400, 11 million to enter Miami's Instagram followers. He's got 480 million Instagram followers. So he's just putting out stuff on Instagram like, hey, check this out. Y'all want a piece? Y'all want to watch me play? And he'll tweet out a link to subscription to Apple Plus, his MLS package, and boom, he gets a piece of it. It's fantastic. It, I mean, it's just a great deal. And remember, keep in mind that he's not the first one to do this because uh, David Beckham did first, and he ended up getting a piece of Inter Miami, bought the team, and now I believe the valuation may be hovering somewhere around a billion dollars, or at least it, it could be a billion dollar valuation. Um, but his impact has been unbelievable, and like I said, we can go through all some of the, the money numbers too. Uh, but like I said, he's getting a lot of you know the, the cut from these uh, different revenue sharing deals jerseys and all that kind of stuff so the nfl owners i i believe are paying attention how do we know the nfl owners are paying attention to what Lionel messi's doing because these owners and they're like i said they they're savvy and that's why they love roger goodell because roger goodell they made more money than ever with roger goodell there the public doesn't like roger goodell and they don't necessarily have to like, like roger goodell because he's their politician he's supposed to take all of the Know the negative uh, blowback, he deals with all that. And stories like this, usually there could be some negative blowback, but not for not for this one, because I, I think it went so under the radar that nobody really knew what was going on. So I just told you about the Lionel Messi deal, and I just told you about the David Beckham thing. He also is one of those guys who, who's had, who had that deal. And I don't know if there are a lot of other American sports examples of guys getting revenue sharing deals and then – even potential team equity deals. And that's what Beckham and that's what Messi essentially got. And MLS is willing to do that. So this week, I'd be you not, the NFL <laughs> voted to pass a new rule, and this is among the owners, that no player or employee can ever get team equity. Yeah, <laughs> they 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 put the kibosh on it immediately. They adopted a rule prohibiting the giving by some team, like Inter Miami did, of giving equity of the franchise to players or other employees. They cited a reason, and you and how about this? You know who you know who did it? You know the the presenting uh, owner who actually penned the memo. It was authored by Chiefs owner Clark Hunt. Damn right, because there's one quarterback in the NFL that's worthy of getting team equity share. It'd be Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> He's like, yeah, you know what? Let's uh, we don't want to do that. And not necessarily that they're going to give it to Patrick Mahomes, but if some other franchise, some franchise decides, you know what? We're so damn desperate to get a quarterback. We'll do what the Cleveland Browns did, and we'll break rank. And give them a guaranteed deal. And the these billionaires are so they're savvy because they're billionaires. They decided that the contract for Deshaun Watson 
never happened. Every year, basically, since the modern salary cap and the modern era of the quarterback, the quarterback deals have been done on precedent. Most of y'all don't even like it because you think this quarterback is overpaid or that quarterback is overpaid. Honestly, guys, it's like the Austin housing market. I can't tell you why that lot in East Austin is worth $1.7 million, but it is what it is. All right. Daniel Jones getting $40 million. All right. Um, so the quarterback market being what it is, you know, they, you know, the, the basically billionaires decided we're not, even though he's based on precedent, usually quarterbacks who got paid, you take that last contract, they already set a new bar, and then you get paid a little bit more than that. It happened with Justin Herbert, happened with Jalen Hurts, happened with Lamar Jackson most recently, uh, even happened with Kyler Murray before that. But all those contracts came after Deshaun Watson's contract, and Deshaun Watson's contract was fully guaranteed. And basically the NFL billionaires club, billionaires boys club decided, yeah, that never happened. Never happened. Nope. We're not going to honor that contract as precedent. Crazy. It's like my man Mike Harsh to say they broke out the men in black flash on a and now, like we, we're supposed to ignore that contract. Shout out to David Mulligetta, by the way, who he's a he's a lifetime long horn with the Texas David Mulligetta, who basically pulling off that contract made him the Johnny Cochran of NFL agents. That guy had multiple uh civil lawsuits of set and allegations of sexual misconduct against him. And in the midst of that, even though he hadn't played the year before and was facing suspension going forward, he got a fully guaranteed deal. Like I said, Johnny Cochran of NFL ages. David Mulligetta, do you have running backs? Do you represent running backs at all? Man, can we get that done? No, maybe not. Uh, okay, so <laughs> the uh, the NFL billionaires, they, they weren't just busy making sure that uh, Patrick Mahomes and other quarterbacks in the NFL – don't get equity in their teams, which is a smart move by them. They're, those billionaires always stay one step ahead. But also, they, they've been a little bit busy the last couple of years trying to address the skeleton in their closet. Right now, every league, every, every corporation has got skeletons in the closet. Right? They, you know, corporations get, have the same rights as people. <laughs> so they have skeletons in the closet just like we all do. And one of the skeletons in the closet for the NFL, we all know, is the concussion crisis. All right. Uh, oh, Adam DeLeon says he represents Bijan. Good. More running backs need to need to run to David Mulligetta to have him represent him. But I digress. Um, it's, it's one of those things where the skeleton in the closet for the NFL is pretty obvious. It's the concussion crisis. CTE, whatever it is. I mean, you guys have seen the numbers. There's like a that's like an 85 or 90 percent chance that I have CTE. If you played football at the highest levels for a certain amount of time, based on the studies, there's a really good chance you got some, you know, what degree of CTE. I believe there are like different degrees of uh of how extreme the CTE can be. Uh, but I, I I really truly have done the research and it, it pretty much says if you've played the game for a certain amount of time and you've now I've never made any big hits or anything like that, but if you've played the game that long. Um, you know, you probably maybe have some mild form of it or whatever. They haven't studied enough of it, but that's just based on the research I've done. But anyway, but I digress. And sometimes my CTE may be acting up. So y'all forgive me. But anyway, I digress. <clears throat> Getting back to it. The skeleton in the closet for the NFL is the CTE and it's head trauma. DeMar Hamlin happened last year. Tua happened last year. So we ain't above having that discussion, it's not something that's way in the past or it's something that they can sweep on the rug. It's been in our face, all right? And I know that <clears throat> DeMar Hamlin wasn't a head injury, but in the context of what I'm talking about, it has the same effect because moms, moms at home who are watching football, they are growing more and more reluctant to let their kids play football, their, their young boys play football uh, because – even with them trying to make the game safer, still a violent game. And by the way, they try, basically they've taken, they've legislated a lot of the violence out of the game. Listen, I left the NFL because I had three shoulder surgeries in five years and I was done. All right. And the reason is that because I'm five, eight, about 190 pounds. And, and at the time they had not outlawed the wedge. If y'all know what the wedge is, the wedge is when, 250 to 300 pound human beings are allowed to interlock arms and run towards you 
as a wall of human beings. And the advice of the special teams coach would be, and I'm not making this up, if you want to make this team, I need you to blow up that wedge. Meaning he needs a 190-pound Rod D to split the wedge between a 260 to 300, 300 pound human being, depending on who it is. And he wants me to split that wedge. Three shoulder surgeries later, uh, I tried to split that wedge. Listen, the coach tell me to split the wedge. I'm going to split the wedge. All right. When you watch that film, you're going to see right B that look like I died on the field or I'm going to split that wedge. Now, I look like I died on the field a couple of times because I just went limp trying to split the wedge. I got hurt on special teams every injury I had. Anyway, my point is they've legislated a lot of that out. You can't have the wedge. You can't have that. You can't have, uh, you know, down blocks. A lot of that stuff is out of the game. And as well, it should be out of the game. I mean, NFL used to sell the NFL used to sell sex and violence. It doesn't sell sex and violence anymore. They need to, right? It's the cheerleaders. Hell, half of the cheerleaders in the NFL have sued their their team for <laughs> discrimination, uh, sexual or sexual harassment, or you know, uh, wages for wage discrimination, all types of different stuff. You can go look it up. Uh, my point is, it, it, at this point, there are certain things in life that are more of a burden than a benefit, right? The penny. Like, why the hell are we still making the penny? It costs more to produce the penny than the penny's worth that we're still making the penny. Because somebody making a pretty penny off of that penny. Right? So <laughs> some things are more of a burden than the benefits. Like, I don't even know why there are pay phones out there except in the airport, but they are more of a burden than benefits. Uh, shout out to people who do yellow, like yellow pages and white pages. Is that still a thing anymore? More of a burden than a benefit. Uh, I used to say that about printed porn, but no longer. I had somebody in the armed forces say, no, no, no. They still use printed porn a lot overseas. So there you go. The printed porn still in that. It's not in that category. But my point is, some things are more of a burden than a benefit. And for, for the NFL, violence, considering the CTE crisis and considering, you know, scenes like DeMar Hamlin, they want that out of the game. Because right now they sell fantasy football, baby. We sell points. We sell quarterbacks. That's what we sell. So the sex was what we needed with cheerleaders out there. We don't necessarily even need the sex anymore. We're good. There's enough sex around us constantly. Back when they came out with cheerleaders, that was like Tech Shram and them dudes. They was trying to like, dude, listen, it's got violence. Americans love violence, but they also love sex. How can we involve sex or make them think about sex while watching this game? Well, I got an idea. Boom. There you go. <laughs> and it's a great idea. We love, we love violence and we love sex. You combine them, it's probably, you know, probably going to be a winning venture for you. So, but I think the NFL is going to be, I think in 20 years, the NFL is look different. I don't even think, the kick, we may not have kickoffs by then, or they may not look the same. We may not have cheerleaders on the sideline by that time. Everything will look very different. But the NFL's problem still exists. So right now, they're trying to fix the problem. And the problem is, how do I make future moms, how do I make future moms more, how do I make them a little more excited? How do I make them more enthusiastic about the game of football? Therefore, they'd be willing to let their young men play the game, even play it a little bit earlier. And you know what they're doing. And it's brilliant. It's it's a multi-pronged strategy. Did you hear that the NFL's going to have their Super Bowl simulcast on Nickelodeon? Yeah. It's the first Super Bowl they're going to simulcast on have a Nickelodeon broadcast. They've been doing it for a couple of games. I think they have like four games. Um. And in those four games, they've got a really good response from the kids. And since this is the NFL's version of a candy cigarette. Remember the candy cigarettes? Love candy cigarettes, man, back in the day. They basically kind of taste like, to me, the liquor stick and the fun dip. Remember liquor stick and the fun dip? Tastes like that. But th think about the psychology of the candy cigarette. And as somebody told me they still sell them. Like a candy store on South Congress or something. I don't know if that candy store is still open, but it still that's why they still sell candy cigarettes. But remember, as a kid, when you'd have the candy cigarette, you would mimic a smoker. You would put it around, right? Let me, let me light it. You know, you would <laughs> you would actually mimic a smoker because you knew what a smoker would do. You put it in your mouth, talk to your friend. You know what, man? Man, it does, man. Just act like you're talking, having a conversation with the candy cigarette in your mouth. Wow, the psychology. Yes, Robbie did smoke. Six for a little bit. I was a menthol man. I no longer smoked the menthol. Shout out to my wife. She broke me out of habit. Essentially, they went up in price and she started throwing cigarettes away every time she would find them in my bag. 
and kind of broke me out of habit. I got tired of buying them and they were too expensive. She threw them away every day. I was like, I had to choose between the woman and the cigs. I chose the woman. I didn't need the cigs as much. But if I'm out drinking and having a good time and somebody's got a smoke and it's the right kind, I will bum a smoke. I'm still that guy. Okay. But anyway, getting back to it. So the NFL's candy cigarette is partly that Nickelodeon broadcast, which is brilliant because the kids love it. And the other part of it is, do you ever see the, the Pro Bowl now for, for the NFL? That version of the Pro Bowl now? Because they don't play the game anymore. Uh, the Pro Bowl now for the NFL is essentially, it's basically kids games. It's field day. It's, uh, they, they play kickball. They play, uh, they play dodgeball. They do the catch, the best catch, all this kind of stuff. And here's, this is the key. And we had a texter already jump on it. This smart texter. Um, flag football. It is the ultimate candy cigarette. I had no idea. I went down this rabbit hole. The NFL is doing their damnedest to try to make flag football an Olympic sport. And I didn't, in the last 10 years, the NFL, sorry, the, for the next 10 years, the NFL is expected to spend a billion, about, you know, I, I would say a billion dollars basically internationally to try to grow the sport and grow the game. And one of the ways they're doing it, and they, I think a big way they're trying to do it is they believe flag football is their kind of candy cigarette to the international influence. Now, the truth is, one of the big mysteries in sports, really for Americans, but even internationally, is why can't the NFL catch on na it, nationally? It is, it is America's number one TV show. Number one TV show in America. All right? 80% of the... 82% of the most watched games, the most watched sporting events in America in 2022 were NFL games. So it is the number one TV product in America. Like there, There's no TV product in America that is more successful and more watched than the NFL, period. So it's our number one TV show. Why can't the number one TV show in America catch on internationally? It's a bit of a mystery. The NFL is trying to figure it out too because – the NBA has figured it out, and the NBA is making five billion dollars in China. I don't. We don't need the politics, please. You're entitled to have your opinion. Um, and they're making a billion dollars in Africa. They're making six billion dollars just by going to Africa and China, and they're trying to get into India and other places because there's a ton of money over there. And it feels like, yeah, we need some of that. I want some of that money. Can we get a little piece of that to expand our revenue pie? And flag football, like I said, it's going to be their candy cigarette. Now, I went and got this quote from Damani Leach. He's the chief operating officer, the COO of NFL International. And he's the one that said they're going to plan to spend a billion dollars annually um, to grow the game internationally. The NFL is going to reinvest a billion dollars to grow it internationally. And a lot of it is through flag football. Because why? Here's the main reason. Because girls can play it. I got a little cousin who I went and watched her play flag football out there at West Lake. She had a little team. Um, oh, Coach McWilliams, he had like a granddaughter out there playing. They was nice. They was doing them, they was doing them little dudes dirty out there. It was, I ain't going to lie, they could hold their own. And the point is, to the candy cigarette is, when those girls become women and they're playing flag football, Maybe they got a close relationship with the game. Maybe they got a different relationship with the game than my mom did. My mom didn't want me to play football. I didn't play tackle football until I got in the seventh grade. First of all, mom was like, I ain't paying for you to play football with some, you know, youth league. That ain't happening. You ain't playing a little league. And she's like, I don't like, you know, the, the way <laughs> – she's like, I don't like the way football uh, is basically played – uh, at the youth level because they used to let you just kind of wail off and hit. I mean, that was – the culture was, hey, even at a young age, lay the hammer on somebody. Mama didn't like that. So I didn't get to play. I played street ball till then. Didn't play no flag football, just played street ball. And got a chance to play in seventh grade. Mama let me play. The rest is history. History that, you know, we'll talk about later. But – so I didn't play the game because my mom thought the game was a little too violent. And – my mom couldn't even watch the games, actually. She would pace. She would get up and walk around because she couldn't watch the games because sometimes she'd get anxiety watching me 
if I got up too slow on a play, that kind of stuff. So there are a generation of moms that know football is a dangerous game. It's like, no, nah, we don't want to deal with that. The NFL is trying to change and flip that narrative. And they're hoping that if they can get enough young girls playing flag football who love the game that much, that they'll love, they'll continue that love affair with the game going forward. And as a matter of fact, the state of California, along with New York, Nevada, I believe is in there too. Uh, they have already made flag football, women, girls flag football, and actually sanctioned UIL sports. So like they they have championships. Alabama did it too. And like they're having girls flag football championships in high school. It's brilliant. And the NFL, how about this? In California, the Rams and the Chargers, they run a pilot girls flag football league in Southern California. Because right now she's about getting women to fall in love with the game. And if you got to do that through flag football, and that's the way you got to do it. And internationally, it ain't, it's not, see, here we don't need guys to play a lot of flag football. It's great to learn technique and early on to establish your fundamentals, but you don't need it. The game is so damn popular. It's the number one TV show in America. Everybody's watching football all the time. Um, but internationally, they're using it because they're, they're, they're taking the same approach. They're trying to get it in schools and have schools play it internationally uh, in their elementary schools and in high schools. They play flag football as almost a substitute for kickball or a substitute for, you know, whatever, dodgeball, whatever you're going to play. And it's working. Um, the, if you look at American flag football in Europe right now, uh, they call it the, the International Federation for American uh, Football. They say they have now 72 nations that are a part of it. Um, they say they have 20 million players playing flag football in 100 countries. Japan has half a million elementary school kids playing football. Um, another uh, 100,000 in Mexico. At the last Super Bowl, they had a international women's flag football exhibition between Mexico and Team USA, Team USA and Mexico won. <laughs> so these billionaires, they're thinking, listen, I want some of that international revenue that the NBA is getting. Five billion in China, one billion in Africa. Where can we get some of that? All right. You know what? Let's get these women all around the world. Let's get everybody involved with flag football. Specifically, let's get women because that'll help us. It'll be twofold, right? That's two birds with one stone. These young women, young women, girls who are gonna be women and moms one day, they'll look at the game differently than the moms, like my mom, who was scared for her son to play the game of football. They'll be out there, you know, tweaking his technique, criticizing technique. Oh man, you got you got to get low. Yeah, you 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 know, get your hands up, your hands down on your side. They'll be they'll be critiquing them. It'll be great. A whole generation. And the NFL is thinking about it. So this is part of their billion dollar investment. So these billionaires are always thinking ahead, man. Just let you know, they're always thinking ahead. And this is why I'm not a billionaire. I'm not I'm not, I'm not thinking that far ahead. So they're making sure that <laughs> nobody in NFL gets the Lionel Messi deal, and at the same time trying to make sure they expand the footprint for football across the world. Speaking of football, guys, we have to discuss the NBA efficacy and the WWE efficacy of the NFL. This Sean Payton, Nathaniel Hackett, Aaron Rodgers jet story is just too damn good. We'll discuss it. I'll tell you why it's such an outlier, why it's great for the NFL, why it's great. Honestly, it's great for sports overall. And it's once again, a, a black shirt on the production I made about the Jets and their hard knock season. I'm going to reiterate that black shirt on prediction. We're going to do that. We come back on the other side as well. Uh, let's let it breathe a minute. My man Blake behind the scenes working hard. Let's take a break in three, two. One of our very first Orange Bloods recruiting flashbacks will focus on a player that went on to become one of the best running backs in the history of the sport. 
Jamal Charles was a high four-star prospect by Rivals.com when he signed with the Longhorns in 2005, finishing number 57 overall in the Rivals 100 and number four overall in the state of Texas. Personally, I had Jamal Charles as a five-star prospect on my Lone Star Recruiting Top 100 list, but I have to admit that I wasn't head over heels in love with him the first time I watched his junior film as a prospect. It's hard for me to admit this out loud, but I actually had questions about his speed <laughs> and whether he was really as fast as his track exploits suggested he was. Ultimately, he was scoring touchdowns as a junior at Memorial by such wide margins that he really never had to open up his speed on the field as much as he just seemed to coast. It didn't take me long to figure out that questioning his speed was one of the dumbest things I've ever done while working in this industry. And that's probably saying something. The most dramatic part of his recruitment might have come on the day he decided to commit to the Longhorns because when he picked up the phone to call running backs coach Mike Haywood, no one was there to take the call. Charles told Jason Sukumel of orangebloods.com that he would call Mac Brown back the next day and make it official. And that's exactly what he did. The hit rate for the class was exceptional as Charles was joined by the likes of Henry Melton, Roy Miller, Jermichael Finley, Roderick McElroy, Quan Cosby, Chris Hall, Charlie Tanner, and of course, Colt McCoy. When it's all said and done, and you look back at the last quarter century of Rivals.com ranking prospects, Jamal Charles is one of the greatest Longhorn prospects that ever lived. All right, welcome back, folks, to the Rodcast right here on on the Orange Bloods, man, on uh, OB Live. I like it, baby. Having a great time. Appreciate all you guys and your input. Uh, also, how about this? My man, Alfio Randall's on the chat. What's up, big cat? Hold up, man. That's a that's, that's, that's shout out. That's like that. I like that. Um, that's pretty good. Um, someone says here that uh, my school in Houston – the first school in the state with girls flag football. Oh, Legacy School of Sports Sciences is the pilot school with a partnership with Houston, Texas. Appreciate that. I like that. Yeah, there you go. <clears throat> and he said he just got off the phone with Jamal. Oh, there you go. Shout out, man. I love, appreciate that love. That's a lifetime longhorn right there. Okay, let's get back to it. So <clears throat> if you guys haven't heard, man, this Nathaniel Hackett story is fantastic. If you haven't heard, let me just get you up to speed. <clears throat> we'll be quick about this. I won't go through all the quotes and read everything, but uh, man, this this story is it's salacious, <laughs> and it is the gift that just keeps on giving. It, it really just keeps on giving. So Sean Payton, he did an interview with uh, Jared Bell, I believe is his name, of uh, USA Today, and he, he he explained that he and Jared Bell are really close and that you know they talk all the time so maybe he got things mixed up maybe he just relaxed too much maybe something he thought was off the record was on the record but either way sean payton had some comments as the new head coach of the Denver broncos about the team last year which was coached by nathaniel hackett and also about the culture of the team all right and the team that he took over and one of the he said a few things that got him in trouble one of the things he said was about nathaniel hackett saying Quote, it might be, it might have been one of the worst coaching jobs in the history of the NFL. That's how bad it was. He did name names. He said, uh, when they asked him about Russell Wilson, he said, there's so much dirt around. There's 20 dirty hands. But what was allowed, tolerated in the freaking training rooms, the meeting rooms, the offense. I don't know, Hackett. A lot of people had dirt on their hands. It wasn't just Russell. He didn't just flip. He still has it. This BS that he hit a wall. Shoot. They couldn't get a play in. They were 29th in the league in pre-snap penalties on both sides of the ball. So, yeah, he named names. And how about this? He also called out the J-E-T-S, Jets, Jets, Jets. He said it doesn't happen often when an NFL team or organization gets embarrassed. He said, but that happened here. Part of it was their own fault relative to spending so much time trying to win the offseason, the PR, the pomp, the circumstance, marching people around and all this stuff. We're not doing any of that. The Jets did that this year. You watch. Hard knocks, all of it. I can see it coming. Remember when 
Dan Snyder put that dream team together. I was at the Giants. I was a young coach. I thought, how are we going to compete with them? Deion Sanders is there now. That team won eight games or whatever. So listen, just put the work in. He also went on to say, we're going to do the opposite of everything they did last season. Essentially implying that they're yeah, like George Casanza, the opposite is <laughs> just going to work better for him. I, I, first of all, this is, I've said before, this is kind of like you talking trash and talking ish on your significant other's ex. It can only make your, ex, it can only make your significant other feel good talking trash on, on the ex, right? So you can blame all of her issues, uh, her insecurity, her trust issues, her, uh, her lack of intimacy issues. You can, her lack of communication, all that stuff. You can just blame on the ex, even though, you know, eh, yeah, we, I'm gonna still have to work through some of them issues, but for now, let's all feel good about it. It was, it was her ex's fault. Your ex screwed you up. That's what happened. You're great. Your ex sucks. That's basically what this message is. That's the messaging there. And I totally get it because that's his team. And that group, that team went through that season last year. So they all, their self-worth, trust me, I was a Detroit Lion. Their self-worth right now is suffering as a team, all right? They're, they're self-esteem. They don't necessarily have a lot of confidence. This is him saying, no, no, guys, y'all are still great players. That that guy, he was that bad. He was really that bad. He also went on to say, sometimes evaluating film. He didn't say that in this interview. I read another comment from a reporter that he couldn't even evaluate the film sometimes because he didn't know what the scheme was because it was executed that badly. So fast forward, Robert Sala hears about these comments and Robert Sala responds by taking the high road. It was a really cool comment. He took the high road. And then uh because i think the story blew up and became too, too big sean payton walked it back he decided to backpedal just a little bit so he backpedaled and said yeah you know what i thought that i was basically still being an analyst because i just came from the analyst role and yeah i don't take back what i said but you know maybe i shouldn't have said it that way that kind of stuff and then aaron Rodgers, by the way he and nathaniel hackett are bffs aaron Rodgers said the day that he was introduced <clears throat> as the jets quarterback one of the main reasons he came was because of Nathaniel Hackett. He loves Nathaniel Hackett. Loves him. Like, they, they are BFFs, man. They, they down like four flats. Um, and so Aaron Rodgers was a little upset, too. And when they asked Aaron Rodgers about it, Peter Schrager did from, was it Good Morning Football? Aaron Rodgers, in one of the quotes, said, I think Sean needs to keep my coach's name out of his mouth. When was the last time we heard any NFL player say something like that about a coach? No, it's something in the NBA, stuff like that happens all the time. The NBA, that's just a thing. Hell, you had one point, you had a, a player choke a coach <laughs> in the NBA. That Those interactions happen all the time in the NBA. You go back and forth. Remember, hell, even they had, uh, that was actually an altercation this year with an owner it was the denver nuggets owner it was one of those owners where they had like an altercation with a player that kind of thing that happens all the time in the nba that's why it's the nba is a salacious gossip league they thrive on that kind of stuff they thrive on it but this is this is not done and usually there's a code among coaches you don't speak ill of other coaches because you might see that that other coach on your way up or on your way down you know what i mean and that's why it's a good old boys network. We take care of one another because we never know. We might be that guy one day. But, oh, man, I've never seen, I've never heard of a player saying in an interview about another coach, he needs to keep my coach's name out of his mouth. This is some old school, petty trash talk. And the NBA is a petty league. The NBA is a salacious gossip league. And usually, you know, they kind of own the rights to that. The NFL's taking it this year. And yes, like the Texas said, they play in week five. Yes. Oh, the Jets have to travel to the Broncos in week five. Guys, this wasn't even a game anybody cared about. Now, this is a must-watch game in week five. I, it, it's going to be top. Even Mike Tomlin said, when they asked him about it, he said, hey, I don't know about the coach's code. I do know I want to watch that game. They need to make that game prime time somehow. They can't flex it because it's too early to flex. 
but that is going to be a great game. Mike, you're going to have Aaron Rodgers scoring touchdowns and throwing touchdowns, doing a discount, double check celebration in front of Sean Payton. He's going to be, you know, he's going to be doing pelvic thrusts like he's Baker Mayfield out there or something. Oh, man, it's going to be beautiful. Him and Nathaniel Hackett probably will have a celebration, like a, a sideline celebration ready to go so they can celebrate in front of Sean Payton. And, of course, you know, Sean Payton's defense, Denver's defense is legit. Oh, Denver's defense ain't no joke. It's the real deal. So I can't wait. I oh, uh, this is this is so good. And you know what? We need more of this. Guys, do you remember the um the women's national title game? Do we remember that in the women's national title game? And you remember how many viewers it got? 9.9 .9 million viewers for that women's college basketball national title game. It was the most viewed women's national title game ever, of course. But guys, it got higher ratings, crazy, than the Sugar Bowl, the Orange Bowl, and the Cotton Bowls. It got more viewers than the Big 12, Pac-12, and ACC title games, Notre Dame, USC, college football, LSU, Bama, Ohio State, Pitt State, Bama, Texas A&M on primetime. It actually got higher ratings than Thursday night football games in the NFL, for the 2021 NBA Finals, the 2020 World Series. And do you remember why we were all captivated by women's college basketball for a change? Not that the product had fallen off. They've been playing really good women's college basketball for a long time. It was because of the trash talk. Man, these ladies were out there giving the, the Tony Yayo, you can't see me. Yeah, I know y'all say John Cena, but it's actually Tony Yayo. I feel that. But you can't see me all over the court. Angel Reese, Kaylin Clark. Uh, was it Van Life, uh, the other player, uh, Haley Van Life? They were out there giving each other the business, man, talking trash, taunting each other, stunting on each other. And we were like, America, we can't get enough of it. Give me more. Give me some more of that. That's why we did. It's like, it's like fight promotions in boxing or MMA, UFC. Everybody, you know, they're, they're going crazy. They're promoting it. You're talking about they're going face to face, having a face off. There's a little trash talk beforehand, maybe a little scuffle. It's all promotions, baby. It's all this. And this is fight promotions. My prediction, first of all, about Hard Knocks, which we'll get to. This will be the most watched Hard Knocks, I think, ever. I, I think we're going to end up with the most, hard, hard, the most watched Hard Knocks ever. Just because of star power. You got Aaron Rodgers. It's in New York City. Uh, Sauce Gardner is kind of a star on that team. Hell, shout out to Garrett Wilson. He's a, he's a young star on that team. Uh, hell, even Zach Wilson and his thing for MILFs. And all, and his mom, who's a MILF, and all this. Oh man, it's all good. It's all great. It, it got so many great storylines you can throw out there. And now you have this beef in week five that will be addressed, but also it's going to be addressed on the hard knocks. So it's going to be great. Now, the, the one of the keys is you start looking at it. The hard knocks teams don't win a lot of playoff games. There's some really high expectations for the J E T S Jets, Jets, Jets. Now they could break that trend. They really could. I mean, they really could break the trend. But you go look at the the hard knocks, like the contestants, uh, participants, I should say. Uh, they haven't been very successful in the playoffs. So you had 20 teams on hard knocks since 2001. Seven made the playoffs. Three won a playoff game and one AFC title game. That's at least you got one AFC title game. And I went back and looked at also – the new All or Nothing show on Amazon. They follow some teams around. I don't know if you guys have watched this. Uh, they've had five seasons. The Rams, Cowboys, uh, Panthers, Philly, and Michigan football too. Which, anyway. um, So out of those five teams, I guess maybe four because Michigan's a college football team, only one team has won a playoff game. Um, so you're talking about three out of the 20 and one out of four. So you're talking about four out of 20 four teams that are participated in these reality TV shows uh, that are following them throughout the season. That's only four of the 24 have been able to win a playoff game. And recently you have the quarterback uh, show on Netflix. So it's another one. And I would say Kirk Cousins didn't win the playoff game. They won 13 and four, didn't win the playoff game, did have more <clears throat> fourth quarter comebacks than any team in NFL history. Also, had more uh they also won the, the first team ever to win 13 games and have a negative scoring differential so yeah they that, that that team didn't make any kind of sense at all but people love kirk cousins on the show so uh apparently he won over a lot of fans and then you had marcus Mariota, and we know that was just 
following the kind of decline of his career. And then Patrick Mahomes. Uh, so Patrick Mahomes, of course, is right now the best quarterback on the planet. And he proved it once again. Because even with the distractions, like I just told you how hard it is to win playoff games. <laughs> You're talking about 25 seasons of reality-based football docs, uh, docs, docu-series, if you will. And out of those 25, basically, and I guess you can throw in maybe now 27, if you want to count the three individual quarterbacks from the quarterback Netflix show, out of those 27 instances of a docu-series, reality-based docu-series following a football team, you still only got five now that have won playoff games of those teams that those quarterbacks have been on all those teams. So we're talking about five out of 27. <laughs> and you know what? The order reminds me of, because listen, I got a little bit of a connection with reality TV. A little bit of a connection. I always look at reality TV shows, especially the dating ones. Really interested in the, the dating reality TV shows. Fascinating to me. Like The Bachelor, of course. And yeah, The Bachelor is in that, in that conversation, right? The Bachelor is one of those too. If you go look at the like the bachelor the seasons of the bachelor because essentially the beginning of a football team like the early infant infancy of the of a football team you're still establishing the culture and that's early on two days training camp you're establishing a culture and you got reality tv around you you got cameras around you people you don't know around you while you're trying to establish an authentic genuine culture it can be tough that could be a challenge trying to be your genuine authentic self when there's a camera on most people cameras on they act a certain way either they they're shy about being on the camera or hey i'm on the camera baby it's time to show up showtime you usually aren't you're just genuine authentic self on camera and they're following you around all the time if you're building a, a cultivating a culture and building the culture you want people to be their actual genuine selves around each other because y'all gonna be around each other a lot and that's how you build the culture because the culture is just a, about people and how you interact, communicate, the culture every day. You're there together. You're in it together. That's the culture. And just like reality TV, where they're trying to establish a real relationship, a genuine connection with another human being, right? You want to establish, they're trying to get married. So they establish a lifetime partnership. And you're trying to do it while on a, a, an island somewhere, some resort island, <laughs> where you're not, you're not in the real world. Nobody's going to a job. Ain't nobody paying bills, dude. You're on a resort island. You're getting, you know, fed tons of alcohol. And there are, there are cameras all around you. And you're competing with other people, all this kind of stuff. There, there are very few people on those shows that are their authentic, genuine selves. And they're trying to build a relationship and cultivate a culture with another human being. So by the time they actually get done with the shows, there's, there's no surprise and no shock that their relationships usually deteriorate. <laughs> and they don't have a high success rate. So I went and looked at The Bachelor and The Bachelorette. There have been there are 47 of them combined. And depending on which research you do, because sometimes you got to dig into the, the salacious gossip about who's together and who's not. <laughs> right? So I count it. Basically, if you go look at The Bachelor and The Bachelorette, you have nine of the 47. And some people said five, because I haven't, you could say it's either five, but five to nine of the 47 are still together. Yeah, of course, because y'all tried, y'all tried to build a connection with cameras all around you, getting fed with alcohol all the time. Nobody's got to worry about the real world and paying bills and a mortgage. Oh, I got kids at the house too. Oh, where are we going to live? You live in Chicago. I live in Orlando. We'll make it work. Like what? What? And it doesn't work and it falls apart. Because it's not built on authenticity. That is a fake culture. That's not real. It can't be. It's hard. I'm not saying it can't happen. That's why good. That's how good Patrick Mahomes is, y'all. That's how good he is. It didn't matter. He just had a kid too. Didn't matter. New kid, cameras around. It don't matter. We'll talk later about how good he is later on as this show goes on. But getting back to it, that's why you don't have that's why you bachelor and bachelor couples, they can't make it either. They can't. It's too hard to build a genuine connection that way with cameras around. And the same thing about cameras in your locker room, which is supposed to be a sacred place. So I'm not saying it can't happen. There are exceptions to every rule. But 
the J-E-T-S, yes, 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 will also be fighting another enemy, which is going to be toxic to their culture, which is Hollywood, baby. <laughs> Hollywood. And Aaron Rodgers is Hollywood now. He's Hollywood. Y'all know that. He likes dating starlets. You know, he's hanging out with Hollywood people. And now he's in New York City telling coaches to keep my coach name out of your mouth. Oh, this is fantastic. Speaking of reality TV, I do have to, full disclosure, I did audition for The Bachelor at one point. This is true. There is footage somewhere, somewhere of Rod Babers auditioning for The Bachelor. Yes, it happened in Austin. Um, I believe it was man, off of South Lamar, is it like Highball or something like that? I forget exactly. I believe it was somewhere like that. It was a while ago. I, I, I have that witness because it was for the radio station. So some people would listen to it and might have even heard it. But I took Garrett Green, who is now doing play-by-play -play for the Houston, uh, the Sugarland Skeeters, actually. He's damn good. He's awesome. And he went to take video of the whole thing to make sure that was video proof. So I have a witness. And apparently there's video there. But there's also a video of the audition when I went into the room with the producers. And, the, and I wanted to be the first black bachelor. I wanted to make history <laughs> for my people. I was going to be the first. And uh, the lady told me, she was like, you know what? Honestly, you're, you're awesome. You'll be great for one of the contestants on The Bachelorette. You're like one of the guys competing for, you know, for her hand in marriage, but not the actual bachelor, not the guy that was the center of the whole show. So I was a little disappointed, but I was like, ah, you know what? Hit me up. I thought they, they won't hit me up. And they actually hit me up. They hit me up. Um, and before I got back when I was like, you know what, let me, cause I was dating a young lady at the time who is now my wife. And I, I, I asked her, she remembers me asking this question. I asked her, I said, Hey, I got to ask this reality TV show. I think the station might let me do it just for the publicity and everything. Kind of promote it, that kind of stuff. If you, do you mind if I do it? It's even if I go on the show, like I'm not going to get with any of those women, I'm going to be with you and it's all good. You know what I mean? And she was like, well, what if you like win and get far? And I was like, well, I'm going to compete. I'm a competitor. I'm trying to win the day up there. What do you mean? I'm trying to win. Got to do whatever it takes to win, man. Uh, she didn't like that. <laughs> said, we had just started dating too. I don't know. We had been dating like I don't know, a few weeks, maybe something like that, maybe a few months. And she's like, nah, I don't like that. Because I was going to try to win the damn thing. And I told her. I, I made her a promise after we discussed it. I said, I'll go on. All right. As one of these guys. I'll win the whole damn thing. And I'll promise you this. When it comes time for me to propose to the, the woman, I'll propose to you on air, national TV, boom, done. How you like that? Yeah, she still said, if you go on that show, then we ain't no more. <laughs> so that I could have had my, you know what I mean? I could have my reality TV moment. Wife, it didn't want it. So I missed out, man. And I was going to flip that into a, our own reality TV show. Boom, about me and her. Boom, well, that works out great. If not, boom, spin it into another reality TV show. Probably end up being The Bachelor after I already established myself as The Bachelorette. Boom. You know what I mean? So I'm just saying. Didn't happen. So I apologize about I apologize about the story, but I had to get that out there. It's my connection. TV. And I do know that, uh, you know, at one point, I think Chris Sims was considered for it, too. He's going to turn it down, too. Remember Jesse Palmer did, my former teammate with the Giants. The best. Man, I was going to go in there. I was going to, you know, go win the damn thing. I was going to get down. I was going to get up there, act like I was going to propose and tell her, I'm sorry. After I got in, I'm sorry I can't do it because I'm in love with a young lady who's in Austin right now. I was going to boom. That's going to go in this whole dramatic and kind of soliloquy. <laughs> Wifey didn't even want it. She just set up for a regular old proposal. See what I'm saying? You could have been famous with your ego. You know what I'm saying? It could happen. Just throwing it out there. Uh, also, this is we're talking about uh, reality TV shows um, and everything like that. I uh, I will say that my wife, strangely enough, and I won't give details on it, she also went on a reality TV show after she told me I couldn't go on one. How about that? That's how it happens. That's crazy. Uh, all right, <laughs> uh, I'm probably gonna get myself in trouble. Trust me, wife came with it. All right, we got a super chat. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. That's nice. Uh, what is the most important takeaway you want to hear from the first long one practice? Oh, that's good. Actually, 
this is a topic actually this is going to lead me into a topic and okay and I, and I heard PK talk about why well, I didn't hear him I saw quotes from PK talking about this and and I I wonder if I probably should take a break and dive into it cuz I actually uh I want to I want to dig some deep I want to dig deeper and I have notes on it but the thing that I'd want to hear just to answer this the super chat really quickly and we're going to dive deep into it I promise you cuz I want to talk Texas defense and I haven't had a chance to yet the one thing that I want to I want to hear about is that field corner spot That your defense can be vulnerable in a lot of different ways, right? Um, and for think about the Cowboys defense last year. I think about this Cowboys defense all the time. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna go on a rant about the Cowboys defense and how the Longhorns can learn something from the Cowboys defense. But you go look at that that Cowboys defense last season. A lot of you out there are Cowboys fans, and they had that cornerback spot opposite Trevor and Diggs. They did not have many holes on the defense. They had two. They had a interior rush defense issue. That's why they got Jonathan Hankins who got injured. And then they, you know, Lane Vanderish got injured. Remember they re-signed Lane Vanderish and they brought in, uh, I'm sorry, they drafted Mozzie Smith. So they tried to, and they, and they re-signed Jonathan Hankins. So they tried to make sure they can address that interior rush defense. But that cornerback spot opposite Trevor Diggs, man, they had like six or seven different guys play that position. And it was a problem the entire year. It was the best way to come up with a game. It was the easiest way, I should say, easiest way to come up with a game plan to exploit the Cowboys. You just throw up that cornerback spot opposite Trevor Diggs. Let's just go at that guy. Because they had multiple injuries, and they, you know, Jordan Lewis went down, Matthew Brown went down. They kept trying different guys. just wouldn't work. So this year, they went out and got Stephon Gilmore. <laughs> they knew their two biggest issues. Think about it. Their two biggest acquisitions in the offseason, other than Brandon Cooks on offense, talking about defense were drafting uh D tapped in the first round, haven't done that since what the 90s, and then trading for Stefan Gilmore because those are the two biggest issues. And the game plans offensively were so easy against the Cowboys. I'm gonna run right up the gut. If it's no Jonathan Hankins and Layton Van Esch is hurt, and I'm throwing at that cornerback spot opposite Trevon Diggs. Work smarter, not harder. Too easy. Same thing gonna be the case with Texas. Texas defense this year is how this is how you can exploit it potentially. Um, because the offense is going to be fine. I, I can dig into the offense and tell you concerns about the offense, but we'd be nitpicking. They could, they return the entire offensive line, <clears throat> return, you know, all your quarterbacks, 10 of your 11 starters. Let's be honest. That probably should be nine because Rojo should be considered a starter. But you lost Bijan and Rojo. That's your biggest issue, but your weaponry presents the opposing defense with a mathematical equation they cannot solve. They can't double X, man double JT Sanders and also put an extra man in the box. Can't do it. Or double X man, double JT Sanders and put an extra man deep. They can't mathematically, they can't do it. So if they decide to double X man and double JT Sanders, which I ain't gonna lie, I would definitely double X. I'm taking X man out because Sark is stubborn about getting the ball to X man stubborn. Right. We all know that. <laughs> He's going to force feed that ball to X-Man. Even with X-Man got one hand, one hand on him, he'll still force his X-Man. We don't give a damn. One hand, he's still better than everybody else. Kind of insulting to the rest of the wide receivers. And JT Sanders, the best, second best tight end in the country in a lot of people's projections behind Brock Bowers, who's just a, a special kind of freak. So you, and you got a top five wide receiver. So I think if I'm a defensive coordinator, I'm taking those two things away. Those are your proven commodities. Jay Witt would be a problem. I know he's going to be a problem. A.D. Mitchell, one-on-one. -on -one, those guys are going to be a problem because they're going to be one-on-one -on -one most of the time. If you're going to choose to double, you're probably going to double X-Man or you're probably going to double J.T. Sanders. And maybe you'll choose, to, depending on the down and distance and the situation, to just double one. Maybe put, an extra guy in, put that extra guy in the box. But like I said, you can't double everybody. And Texas offense can come at you. What's the name of the movie? Everything, everywhere, all at once. It, it can feel like that with the Texas offense. And I, I, if I am a defensive coordinator, I'm stopping the pass first. I, I'm stopping the pass first. And I'm going to rally to the run. I'll rally to the run. And you got to prove to me you can run the ball because we'll go over some of these numbers too. Like I said, I'm going to pull up some of these stats. We get a break. Texas offensive line last year was mm, below average in run rush block, run blocking. They were a below average run blocking offensive line. And 
the biggest issue we saw in the bowl game was, you know, no B. John Robinson, no Rojo, no creativity in the run game. I think Sara can bring more creativity to the run game. He brought in Paul Chris. I think that's also to infuse him with more concepts in the running game, more innovation. So I do think they understand after watching the Washington performance uh, versus uh, them in the Alamo Bowl that, yeah, you got to find a way to put some, bring some juice to this running game without Bijan and Rojo. I think Sark can handle that in the offseason. I think he can handle that in the lab. I'm not really worried about the offense. Uh, my concern would be the defense because I, I, can, I can pinpoint multiple ways that I want to attack the defense right now. That cornerback spot on the field corner, got a lot of room. You got a lot of field to defend. It's just opposite Ryan Watts. I'm also going after the linebacker uh, opposite Jalen Ford, going after that dude. And whoever the edge rusher is, opposite Baron Sorrell. I got my offensive game plan already. Check, check, check. I already know how my first few plays going to go. Well, I may, not know how they, I may not know what they are, but I know what they're going to exploit and attack. The unproven commodities. Your field corner, your defensive end, edge, opposite Baron Sorrell. And whoever is the linebacker opposite Jalen Ford, those positions may prove themselves. They may prove to be high level, you know, players, whoever ends up taking those spots. But right now they're unproven. Make them prove it. Why, why, why would you go after Jalen Ford? Why would you go after Ryan Watts? Why would you go after Baron Sorrell guys who have been there and already proven that they can play at a high level and you expect their trajectory to continue uh, on that, at that rate, on that, Right, on that pace. So I think for me personally, what I've been concerned about, and I can worry myself a lot worrying about Texas football, those three spots on defense. I need to know what's happening there. Now I heard, not heard, I saw a quote from PK that said the most improved uh, player on defense has been Terrence Brooks. I think Terrence Brooks is going to be crucial. I know they got Gavin Holmes too, but if Terrence Brooks doesn't work out, I think he will. I've, I've, I think his, his dad who's, who's an Aggie <laughs> um, and a footwork coach. I think, you know, I, he's a guy that's got natural footwork and it makes sense because his dad's a footwork coach. So footwork for a lot of guys, it is something that you have to work at constantly to just make sure you're not in any wasted movement, wasted footwork. He's one of the few players, and not a lot of people have it. Some of the guys who play soccer have it naturally. You know, some wide receivers have naturally just really great footwork. But he's got it, – it's ingrained. Like, he's not a lot of wasted movement out of his breaks um, or with him trying to uh, – work, working at the line of scrimmage, not a lot of wasted movement um, in terms of his footwork. And that's because of his dad, who's, a, like I said, a footwork coach and a DB coach. But what I love about uh, Terrence Brooks is what I, I talked to x Men. Xavier Worthy about this. We interviewed him and I asked him, you know, hey, who gives you the most problems in practice? I need to know who's giving you the most issues in practice. And he said, aside from Jade Barron, because he put out that he gave some props to Jade Barron. He said, aside from Jade Barron, because I don't go in the slide as much, but Jade Barron's the guy. So he gave some props to him. He said, Terrence Brooks and Zay X Manson, NFL wide receiver. And if Terrence Brooks has given him some, some, some trouble, that's a good sign. And that's the name he mentioned. I always go with the players and who the players think are legit. That's the man he mentioned. He mentioned Terrence Brooks. So I'm hoping Terrence Brooks will fill that void. But if not, this defense will be easy, easier to game plan for. So that's 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 what I'm looking for. Out of I'm looking for positive reports about that defensive end spot, that linebacker spot, and that cornerback spot. Because right now, that's a lot of that's a lot of weaknesses there's a lot of ways you can pull at that thread and that whole damn sweater comes apart okay so since we're talking texas defense let's get back on that we'll come back and take a break here we come back i want to get into the texas defense a little bit and we'll talk cowboys and longhorns i'll tell you why the longhorns need to be taking a page out of dan quinn's book and they should because steve sarkeesian coached on Dan Quinn's staff, had him come talk at one of his clinics. He's right down the road down there in D-Town. I'm sure they on a tech, a group text or something like that. I'll tell you why. He needs to fire up that group text and hit up Dan Quinn. We'll do that. Uh, let's take a break. Let's let it breathe. Three, two, one. <laughs> This Orange Bloods recruiting flashback focuses on the player generally considered 
to be the greatest Longhorn football player of all time. Vince Young was a five-star prospect by rivals when he signed with the Longhorns in 2002, finishing as the number one overall player in the nation. 20 plus years later, the two things that stand out the most about Young's recruitment was how much ground the Longhorns made up in a blink of an eye. Weeks before his senior season began in 2001, his mother reported that Texas was out Quote, we ruled out Texas as Vincent has decided that he probably won't stay in the state of Texas to play in college, Miss Young said. In just a matter of months following that statement by his mom, Vince Young was pretty much wrapped up to go to Texas. The other thing that stands out about Young's recruitment was just how big he was in the city of Houston. I went to a playoff game with Madison against Hightower in the Astrodome, and opposing fans were jumping up in the stands over the excitement that Young was creating. I wrote for orangebloods.com at the time, quote, at that point, the Astrodome crowd started to go crazy. People in the high tower section were high-fiving each other, laughing and screaming in amazement, end quote. It was unlike anything I've ever seen before or since. On the day he committed to the Longhorns in January, Vince said, quote, there's a lot of love down there at Texas, and that's what I was looking for before I visited. They made my mom smile, and that's all I needed to see. I committed to them this afternoon. Young was the bell cow of a 2002 recruiting class that was ranked first in the nation and is regarded as one of the best in the history of the school. That class signed six five-star prospects, which also included Justin Blaylock and Roderick Wright. Ultimately, Young's class was the foundation of the 2005 National Championship team. All right, welcome back, guys. Okay, to end the show, which will be coming up, uh, I don't know, in like 20 minutes or so, we will do kind of a, I don't know, uh, audience kind of super chat, you know, free for all. You guys send topics or send me uh, a question and boom, in the super chat and I'll, I'll hit it. So we'll do that. But you can see them all throughout the show, of course. But I want to make sure I dedicate a segment for it um, because we appreciate all you guys and all your support. Okay, let's get to this Texas defense. Um, and, you know, one of the things that bothers me about the Texas defense last season, and it was a great turnaround, by the way. It's one of the, historically one of the greatest turnarounds we've seen in the history of Texas football for a defense. Because in 2021, that was one of the worst defenses in Texas football history. And now you're talking about a top 30 defense last season. And part of it was Gary Patterson. All right, no doubt. Got to give PK some credit. Garrett Patterson, he is in a cat bird seat position. I don't know if he's coming back, uh, but yeah, anytime the defense played at a high level, people gave Garrett Patterson credit. And every time the defense did not play at a high level or, or disappointed uh, in some way, then, which wasn't a lot, by the way, uh, people would throw out PK's name. So they would only talk about Gary Patterson when the team was playing, when the defense was playing well, and they would bring up PK when they saw something subpar about the defense. But PK didn't care. He's an unselfish guy. So give him a lot of credit because uh, he, there was no, from what I can hear and what, uh, what has been reported, he was not disgruntled about that at all. As a matter of fact, he welcomed it. And he welcomed it because he needed it. He miscalculated the, the Big 12. The Big 12 is an ever evolving league, right? It's constantly evolving. The Big 12 is now, at this time, it is a running a running league cross-dressing as a passing league. And I think PK was listening to all the old, you know, kind of folklore about the Big 12 and how it was terraformed by the air raid. And it was. And at one point, it was an air raid league and producing some of the best quarterbacks in the NFL, like Patrick Mahomes. Hell, Jalen Hurts is even considered a Big 12 quarterback. And Big 12 quarterbacks and air raid quarterbacks were lighting up the NFL for a little while, too, right? You can get Jared Goff in that conversation. So with the trickling up of that, those concepts, uh, the Big 12 is an ever kind of evolving league because now it's evolved. And the reason why, just a quick short lesson, the reason why it evolved into being now kind of a running league, cross dressing and passing league, is, is pretty simple. It's because the teams were getting basically blitzed offensively. They were getting lit up offensively with the vertical passing game. And the natural adjustment is, well, I'm backing my safeties up. I'm going to back my safeties up, and I'm going to go play a lot of two high safeties. That's having two deep safeties. That'll play your, that's your cover fours. You'll play your two deep safeties. You can play a lot of split zone where you can split half the field, play one coverage on one half, another cover on another half. And you can play that in the split field. And it keeps the offense 
from being able to connect on those vertical shots down the field. So, but you have the numbers. Like I told you, you have the numbers in the passing game, but that means you lose the numbers in the running game. And defensive coordinators were willing to die a death of a thousand cuts rather than, you know, just a, a straight up, you know, gunshot to, to, right to the face, which is what the deep shot represents. Like, man, that's boom, done. You're done. All right. So they figure let's make them march the length of the field, handing off the ball three, four yards in a cloud of dust. That works better. And eventually offenses will get frustrated and then maybe they'll decide to throw it and then they'll throw it into coverage. And then that's how our defense will kind of stabilize. So the, actually the big 12 turned into that. Matter of fact, the Big 12 went as far as to have three high safeties at times. Right? You even had teams like Oklahoma State and then Iowa State popularizing the three high safeties to get even deeper into the weeds. And with that happening, offenses decided, let's work smarter, not harder. Why the hell are we going to be running, you know, passing the football into coverages where we don't have a numbers advantage, where they outnumber us and they can essentially – you know, double team different guys and take away the pass. No, work smarter, not harder. Let's run the football because we have the numbers advantage in the box. So teams started running it more. If you look, the Big 12 became more of a running league. And that just happened over, you know, kind of a, a period of uh, adaptation by the Big 12. And I actually predicted at the time, because the Big 12 used to be an air raid league, right? At one point, 75 to 80% of the league were running the air raid. That's coming back, by the way. Tech running the air raid now. TCU uh, was was running their version of the air raid. And so there's some teams now that are running the air raid again in the Big 12. So which means you'll see that evolutionary adaptation happen again. Because when defenses adjust to teams running the ball more, how do they adjust? They put that extra guy in the box. He's not deep. They put him in the box and they go single high coverages. All right. With just one deep safety, your cover threes and your cover ones and you put the extra guy in the box, and now defenses have the numbers advantage in the box, but offenses have the numbers advantage in the passing game. And then they'll start to pass more. This cycle goes on and on. <laughs> on and on and on and on. It'll go back and forth forever. All right? And matter of fact, it's happening in the NFL right now because if you go look at the NFL right now, teams continue to increase their too high coverage looks. Right now they're playing close to between 45 and 50% of their looks in the NFL are two high show looks, one of the highest numbers in, uh, in NFL history since they've been monitoring this. So it's happening. Why it happened in the NFL? Why are they dropping safeties back in the NFL? Well, you got Patrick freaking Mahomes, who's got a, a cannon and he's chunking it deep all the time. You got Josh Allen, who also, just like Mahomes, he's got a cannon. He's chunking it deep. You got teams like the, uh, the Philadelphia Eagles like to chunk it deep. A lot of teams, they want to throw it down the field. And with that in mind, teams are deciding, I'd rather, like the Big 12 defensive coordinators, I'd rather die the death of a 1,000 cuts with my safeties deep and not let them get that vertical haymaker and force them to march the length of the field. There's a good chance somebody screws up, somebody makes a mistake. Give my defenders a chance to make a play. And that's why deep, deep offenses are now going to quick game. 60% of the NFL's passing game, quick 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 game. That's hitches, slants, outs, right? Get out of, get out of your hands. In, in you know a three-step drop all right boom in and out and that's because basically that's kind of taken over as the extension of the running game but anyway that's deep in the weeds so the nfl and the big 12 follow a very similar evolutionary adaptation but this is why i want this is what i want from from texas and i want to see it from really from really if i was to say from, from uh Dan Quinn, but Dan Quinn's got nothing to do with it. They need to seek out Dan Quinn's help, I should say. But it's something that I actually want to see PK do. And I think Sark can reach out and help with this as well. Because Sark is actually the one who's worked with Dan Quinn before. Right? He's actually been there and worked with Dan Quinn. And the reason I love Dan Quinn's defense, there's a lot of reasons to love Dan Quinn's defense. It's, it's probably my favorite defense to watch in all of the NFL. And it's the most opportunistic defense in the NFL. It's created 67 takeaways in the last two years, and that number has led the NFL uh, in both years. It led the NFL 34 one year and 33 the next year. And they're the first defense to lead the NFL in takeaways in back-to-back -back years since the Steel Curtain defense, right? And you think to yourself, well, how do they do this? What is, like, what's the key for Dan Quinn? 
and Dan Quinn, there's a, there's a lot to his formula. And I've been trying to break it down to study it. One of the first things that Dan Quinn does is Dan Quinn uses more three high safety defense than anybody in the NFL. Like, now it's not three high. It's actually just three safeties. They call it big nickel, big dime. He's using three safeties. He uses a ton of it, a ton of this, these three safety looks. And what these three safety looks allow him to do is win the, uh, the battle of the pre-snap disguise and the shell looks. With those safeties, those being movable chess pieces, you can continuously move them around the chessboard. And he, he does. Nobody has better pre-snap shell disguise looks than the Dallas Cowboys. Because those three safeties are everywhere. Malik Hooker, Donovan Wilson, J. Run Curse. He puts them in the box. He puts them deep. They're in the slot. They're blitzing. He puts them out. If you're a quarterback, the pre-snap read never matches the post-snap diagnosis. Not with Dan Quinn. And also, in addition to him trying to confuse and discombobulate quarterbacks with the move, way he moves his safeties, he also twists and stunts and plays more games up front with his D line. For those who know what twist and stunt is, that's when you loop uh, and try to switch your defensive linemen. So sometimes they they uh, sometimes it's a cross. Sometimes you know uh, the the defensive end and the defensive tackle. Sometimes you'll get them running a game or a stunt or a twist where they basically are uh, twisting and stunting up front, replacing each other in responsibilities, trying to confuse the blocking scheme somehow. He runs more twists and stunts than anybody in the NFL. As a matter of fact, they ran more twists and stunts last season than any team in the NFL in the last five years. A lot of them just moving pieces around. And what does that do? Well, that confuses the blocking schemes. So the center who's setting the pass protection also understands that my pre-snap pass pro set, whatever protection I set, it, it's not, it, it may not match <laughs> what the protection needs to be post-snap based on how many times the Cowboys are looping defenders on the defensive front and on the defensive line. So, it is a defense built on creating chaos, confusion. Because the truth is chaos and confusion, it is more likely to be advantageous to a defense than an offense. Offense works on what? Precision, accuracy, right? It's execution. Hell, and offenses, they tell receivers to break on certain steps. Yeah, I want you to break on that slant route on that fourth step. Get that fourth. They practice breaking in and out on routes on a certain step. So if you're a DB, I just need to create confusion and chaos. That's why Dan Quinn, I think, wants to play more bump and run coverage. That's why they're bringing in Stefan Gilmore. I think he wants to play more bump and run coverage up, uh, and get in the receiver's faces and therefore create creating little pockets of chaos and confusion everywhere on the field. My safeties are creating chaos with the pre-snap uh, read your pre snap read doesn't match your post snap diagnosis because they're moving around. All right, the defensive line, the pass protection never really matches what it, it or it never really is compatible with the defensive front, the rush, or the pressure because we're constantly moving guys around. They don't even blitz a lot, there's a lot of twists and stunts and looping and looping their defenders at the line of scrimmage and twisting him at the line of scrimmage, just trying to confuse the blocking scheme. And then you're going to add to that, I got corners that can disrupt timing and execution of the wide receivers by just getting their hands on them and rerouting them a little bit. And what is that going to lead to? Quarterbacks being confused because I need time to process it. My receivers, they're not open. I can't get through my progression because they're being rerouted the line of scrimmage. Also, I'm a little paranoid about this defensive front coming at me because the pass protection that we set doesn't really match what I'm seeing coming at me. And, oh, by the way, I said that I thought that safety would be in the box. Turns out he's in the slot, and the safety that was deep is now down blitzing, and they rotate the other guy. And nobody rotates in their coverages pre-snap to post-snap like the Cowboys. So it's all just built on confusion and chaos. And when you're dealing with a precision, execution, timing, accuracy-based system like every offense is, it's create confusion at every level. That's what, that's what the Cowboys do, and they do it better than anybody. And on top of that, my big belief about football has been the future of football is positionless football. It will just be guys who can – oh, hybrids. Hybrids all over the damn field. And I, I think Dan Quinn, he is the leader. He's the, he's the leading mind 
in positionless football on defense. And he, he uses a lot of it. You're talking about Micah Parsons, of course, Sam Williams, J-Run Curse, Makiamu is in that category too. Uh, Marquise Bell is another guy they throw out there. Remember last year it was Keanu Neal and different guys. I mean, it, it, he's – He's obviously – he's been tinkering with this positionless football thing since his days in Atlanta. Devondre Campbell, who's now, I believe, with Green Bay, he was moving him around like he moves Michael Parsons around, and that was when he was in Atlanta. So he was thinking about it, and then the happy accident, the uh, the serendipity of him drafting Micah Parsons, the best positionless football player on defense, that – yeah, that's the perfect storm, <laughs> uh, perfect combination. So that's why I love his, and his, why his defense is built on confusion. With those hybrid defenders, what can you do with a hybrid defender? Move them around the chessboard. And football is just chess with people. Move them around the chessboard. You need, you need more pieces like, I don't play a lot of chess, more pieces like the queen that can move around everywhere. Can the queen move around everywhere? I need to play more chess. But anyway, you get the point, all right? I made two chess references on the show today. And I don't even play chess, all right? Uh, anyway, so that's why his scheme is awesome. But how this is how it, it, it fits Texas. Texas can't cause enough turnovers right now. They can't. They only had 14 takeaways last season. That was the bottom of the Big 12. And if you want to win the Big 12, you need to be taking the football away. You need to take care of the football, but you got to be able to take it away. Um, there have been six times in the last 20 years that the Big 12 champion finished outside of the top four in turnover margin. Um and it been seven times the Big 12 champion finished first in turnover margin. Texas has taken care of the football pretty good, actually. Uh, they need to take away the football more. And I advise Sark to call Dan Quinn or to copy Dan Quinn's blueprint. It's brilliant. It is. This cause confusion and chaos at every level. Disruption, disruption, disruption. And offenses hate that because they want execution and timing and accuracy and precision. Hand placement here. Offensive linemen, do they, 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 they really calculate their steps till they punch. <laughs> That's a real thing. It's like, all right, I got three steps and I'm going to punch. And, and, and J.J. White always said, man, I just try to confuse them. He said, I used to always give them a stutter and I'd always get high because I know it screws up their footwork. And when old lineman's footwork gets screwed up, then his hands get screwed up because they're step, 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 punch. Screw it up. Just screw it up, man. Chaos, confusion. And I think Texas needs to create more chaos, more confusion. Not enough of it. Maybe that's why they got Payam Sadat. They got any more of that from PK. And it helps when you have hybrid defenders. Now, keep in mind, Texas does have three safeties. Three safeties, they believe, have starting, you know, capability, right? They have, they got Jalen Catalan. They got, um, of course, Jaron Thompson, the elder statesman, and Keaton Crawford. Now, everybody in the Big 12 is playing three high safety defenses and using three safeties because they realize the confusion and chaos it creates. And yet Texas has three of them. I need to see some of that. I saw a little bit of the principles of three high versus Texas Tech last year for Texas, but not enough. And they didn't really have, you know, three starting caliber safeties. Now you do. Maybe that's something they can use. And it also can be a plan B, a contingency plan in case that field corner doesn't work out with Terrence Brooks. You can move Jade Barron out there and use your three safeties. Those are your five DBs. Dan Quinn can tell you how to do it. Or you can watch Iowa State. Now, the three high is different principles than Dan Quinn's three safety defense, but I, essentially you can you can say they're they're very similar in I would say in their rudimentary principles in terms of them just trying to create confusion to move around and be movable pieces on the chessboard. Texas needs to adopt all of that. They need to play more bump and run. They want to. Sark has already said that. Uh, they need to run more twists and stunts up front. And by the way, this fits, right? Run more twists and stunts up front. Because who are the best pass rushers for Texas? Even Sark said, it's Byron Murphy and it's Anthony Hill, the young kid coming off the edge like DeMarvion Overshone last year. He's a natural pass rusher. Okay, if that is the case, how do you create advantageous one-on-ones for an interior defensive lineman? Twists, stunts, get him matched up on their weakest offensive lineman. And interior defensive linemen have a tougher job because usually they get the double team a lot easier. 
They get the double team. It's a natural double team. The safety, I'm sorry, the safety, but the center gets a little piece of them. While the interior lineman gets a little piece of them, it's a little easier schematically to double team that guy, free him up, twist and stunt. So it helps in that regard as well. You got three safeties. Hopefully you figure out who your corners are so you can play more bump and run. And we know Ryan Watts loves to play bump and run. Right? So the reason that Dan Quinn's defense is the most opportunistic in the NFL is because he creates confusion and chaos everywhere. More twists and stunts and games up front than anybody else. Uses more three safety looks than anybody else. And I think now getting Stephon Gilmore, they want to play more bump and run too. So they can just totally discombobulate and confuse quarterbacks and frustrate them. Texas can, Texas can replicate some of that. And I think that because it confuses quarterbacks so much because nothing looks the same pre-snap to post-snap and he ends up throwing interceptions as a result. Or, you know, the think about the RPO now, right? The RPO is designed to count the box or count the numbers in the box. If you have the numbers advantage in the box, you hand it off, all right? If you don't have the numbers advantage in the box, you throw the pass. Dan Quinn is confusing that. He's confusing that motion. He's confusing that concept every time opposing teams try to run it by moving the safeties around. That's what, that's what three high safety defense does too. That's why it matches up well with Sark a little bit. We'll dive into that probably later on this week. But that's what I want from Texas. I need more takeaways from that defense. They need to be more opportunistic. And the way to do it is confusion, chaos. And I did see PK said he's going to start blitzing more. So there you go. Okay. Uh, all right, we're going to do super chat features. Hit me up with questions because we're probably going to get out of here in like 10 minutes. I got a speaking engagement I got to go to. Think about this. I've been speaking for three hours and I got a speaking engagement. <laughs> all right. Uh, shout out to Ray. What's up, Ray? Uh, with all the talk of conference realignment, FSU and Clemson want out of the ACC. Do you see any way they can escape that conference? Yeah, I've seen that TV deal. Now, I'm sure really good lawyers will find ways around it to maybe circumvent that deal. But, man, that ACC deal, it is, uh, it's, it's one of the worst. It's, so, it's a, such a long deal. Right? They, don't, they have not been able to come back to the negotiating table. But FSU and Clemson, talk about brands. If there is a way to get them, I guarantee it. I don't know what conference, whether it's you know, the Big Ten or SEC, I don't know what conference will be looking to – to acquire them, but those are two blue blood brands, brother. They would pay good money. I mean, they or they would help them <laughs> in any way they can. Uh, but yeah, the ACC deal is pretty that uh, it's pretty ironclad, um, from what I hear. Uh, okay, another super chat, and thank you for the uh, the super chats, guys. Thank you, Ray. I appreciate that. Uh, this one comes from Ran. If we need one freshman to come in and make an impact immediately, who do you want that freshman to be? Oh, that's good. Um, I'm a little torn. I'm a little torn between Cedric Baxter and Anthony Hill. And I just, I just got a ranting about that linebacker spot opposite of Jalen Ford that worries me. And I hear it. He's a prodigy. So you definitely need somebody to step up there, but I've been hearing good things about the, you know, the linebacker depth, uh, at least that maybe there's a little more depth than we thought, um, with some of the other guys like, uh, Benda and, um, uh, oh man, what is his name? 30, the hybrid Mo Blackwell. Um, been hearing some better things about them. So I'm hoping that there's more depth at linebacker spot and maybe we don't need to throw those young guys into the fire. And maybe situationally, we use Anthony Hill passing downs as that edge, uh, rush defender like DeMarvin Overshawn was last year. But I will say, uh, Cedric Baxter and I need that running game needs juice and if they're not going to give it juice with the creativity and innovation, which I assume is why you brought in Paul Chris, then you're going to need juice via the personnel you use. And it might be Cedric Baxter. So I like that. The running back depth is, is good, but Anthony Hill needs to be that too. Um, all right. And any other super chats? Send to me because we'll probably get ready to end things pretty soon. I had a bunch of stories I never even got to. So we got plenty of, uh, we got plenty of time to get to a lot of different things, but <clears throat> I do want to, uh, Really quickly, uh, throw out there a couple of uh, thanks. I uh, thanks to my man Blake behind the scenes, man. He's working really hard and doing a great job. Usually we will go to six, uh, but like I said, I have 
I have a speaking engagement that I got to get to. Uh, and I want to try to at least get there on time. So usually we will go to six. So don't worry about that. And I promise you next time we will find ways to get into more super chat conversations with you guys, because uh, that to me is uh, some of the most fun, just kind of go going off the riff, improvising something Sark does not like to do freestyling. All right. We like to do that a lot on this show. We go off script a ton. I got lots of scripts. I got papers galore. I got lots of scripts, but we like to go off script around here. Uh, so I do want to thank my man Blake. I want to thank all you guys for your support. I think it's a really cool project. It's, uh, it, you know, uh, two, two originals, the original Lifetime Longhorn and Orange Bloods. And so I'm a really big fan of not only the site, but my man Jeff Ketchum and War. Appreciate them uh, bringing me on. Let me be a part of it. And I feel like Tupac, man. I feel like when Tupac got bailed out of jail by, uh, you know, Suge Knight and Dr. Dre, death row. That's, that's how I feel. Hopefully this ends a little better than that ended. <laughs> that, didn't, that didn't end too well. They did get some classic hits out of it, though. You, you mean you did get classic jams out of that now? Come on. That's that's the truth. And hopefully that's what we create, too. Some epic classic uh, shows here uh, on Rod, on the broadcast. So I uh, do want to thank all you guys out there for listening and all the Super Chats uh, donations, man. We really appreciate it. We really appreciate it. Everybody working hard in the scenes, trying to provide you guys with the best entertainment possible. Hey, speaking of, uh, you know what, Blake, we should work on this. We should work on, so I made the death row reference. I had somebody text me and say, and I like it, we should get my head with, and you might be too young to remember this, the death row poster and get my head with Jeff Ketchum's and Roars, and then oh, maybe yeah. oh, yeah. we'll have to work on something like classic, that. Classic death row poster, man. You know, yeah, what I mean? that's, fun, that's man. how it feels. Um, yeah. yeah, the one with Pac and, and Dr. Dre and Suge. Might as well just do it all the way. Uh, but thank you, Blake. <laughs> You're the man, brother. I really appreciate you. And I appreciate thank all you, you guys, too. Like I said, we'll be going to uh, six usually, but and your boy's got stuff to do. I got stuff to do, but uh, this was awesome. We'll do it again tomorrow. Same time, same channel. Remember, the revolution will not be televised. We'll be talking about it right here on the broadcast, baby. Peace. <laughs>